Our world today is full of opportunity, but it's also full of challenges, both to business and to investment. For countries to develop their economies, achieve their sustainable... Neden katılım bankacılığı biliyor musunuz? Aslında cevap çok basit. Katılım bankacılığı, birlikte kazanmayı, bununla birlikte inanç ve değerlerimizi yok saymadan kazanmayı esas alır. Katılım bankacılığı, yatırımlarınızın doğru yerlere kanalize edilerek hem sizlerin hem de bankanızın adilce kazandığı bir sistemdir. Nasıl mı? Bir işe yatırım yaptığınızı ya da emeğinizi koyduğunuzu düşünün. O işten alnınızın teriyle elde ettiğiniz kar ne kadar hakkınızsa, birikiminizi katılım bankacılığında değerlendirerek elde ettiğiniz kar payı da o kadar hakkınızdır. Bizce kazanç kadar nasıl kazanıldığı da önemlidir. Bu yüzden katılım bankacılığında şeffaflık esastır. Birikiminizin nerede, ne şekilde değerlendirildiğini bilirsiniz. Böylece bankanızın yaptığı yatırıma, dolayısıyla bu yatırımdan elde edilen kâra ve zarara katılım bankasıyla birlikte ortak olursunuz. Paranız hem kanuni düzenlemelere hem de faizsiz bankacılık ilkelerine uygun yönetilmiş ve değerlendirilmiş olur. Bu sayede birikimleriniz inançlarınıza ters düşecek alanlara değil, toplum sağlığına hizmet eder. Kısaca sizlere daima güler yüzlü ve kaliteli hizmet veren katılım bankacılığı, aynı değerlerle yoğrulmuş, aynı yoldan geçmiş, aynı toprağa basan, aynı havayı soluyan bizlerin bankacılığıdır. Gücümüzü birleştirip, birlikte üretmek, birlikte kazanmaktır. Çünkü siz kazandıkça, birlikte kazandıkça, omuz omuza bir oldukça biliyoruz ki, Türkiye kazanır, Türkiye güçlenir. Türkiye katılımla güçleniyor. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation OIC, is the world's second largest international organization after the United Nations with almost 1.8 billion people and 57 member countries spread over four continents. Since its establishment 40 years ago in Ankara, the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries CESREC, 
has been the first subsidiary organ of the OIC with the objective to serve the OIC and its member countries in the areas of statistics, economic and social research and training and technical cooperation. To strengthen the existing ties and cooperation between Islamic countries, there is an obvious need for reliable and consistent data and information. Serving as the Statistical Data Bank of the OIC, CESRIC contributes to the efforts of member countries to explore each other's potential and needs in order to enhance cooperation among themselves in various areas of socio-economic development. To serve this purpose, CESRIC collates and processes socio-economic statistics from the databases of national statistical officers of member countries and international organizations and disseminates a large number of economic and social statistical indicators through various statistical applications developed by CESRIC, such as the OIC Statistics Database, OIC Countries in Figures, and others. In addition, CESRIC serves as the Secretariat of the OIC Statistical Commission, the only OIC corporation forum in the field of statistics which convenes every year at the level of heads of the national statistical offices of the member countries and representatives of regional and international organizations to assess the possibilities for cooperation through exchange of views and best practices. In the field of statistics, CESRIC also organizes capacity building programs to share knowledge and experience among the national statistical offices of the member countries and improve their institutional capacities and human resources. In the field of economic and social research, CESRIC follows up, evaluates and analyzes the current socio-economic situation in the member countries and reports on this situation through its technical background research reports which cover a wide range of areas including, but not limited to, trade, education, health, agriculture, poverty, environment, science and technology, transportation, tourism and vulnerable social groups such as children, youth, women and elderly people. These reports identify the problems and challenges facing member countries in these areas and suggest solutions for cooperation. In addition to these reports, CESRIC contributes to the policy dialogue mechanism within the OIC framework by preparing and leading the preparation of strategy documents including programs of action, roadmaps and cooperation frameworks on various socio-economic fields and in accordance with the decisions and resolutions adopted by various relevant OIC platforms. CESRIC also shares the outcomes and findings of academic studies and papers in the field of development and cooperation in Islamic countries with the public through a quarterly published academic journal, Journal of Economic Cooperation and Development. The OIC member countries spread over almost 25% of the world land area on four continents and constitute 24% of the world's population with a wealth of natural resources, youth and dynamic human resources, fast-growing economies and strategic trading regions. The OIC member states are also a center of attraction owing to their historical, cultural and touristic values. However, although there are areas where these countries have relatively significant advantages, they are still lagging behind in many areas such as education, health, science and technology and human development. Their shares in global production, trade and foreign investment are still below the desired levels. CESRIC works to develop solutions to the various problems and challenges facing the member states through the cooperation and solidarity approach and by activating the great potential of these countries. CESRIC thus plays a significant role in enhancing the South-South cooperation within the OIC community by using various modalities such as institutional and human resources capacity building programs, seminars, workshops, symposiums, conferences and similar events for sharing knowledge and experience, field study visits, vocational education and skills training, corporation portals, expert networks and rosters. Over the past few years, CESRIC has embarked upon several capacity building projects and initiatives that enhanced knowledge transfer in different contexts based on mutuality, unity and solidarity. While implementing several projects, 
CESRIC adopts a tripartite cooperation mechanism where member countries are actively involved to share knowledge, technology, expertise, and best practices, i.e. provider country, beneficiary country, and CESRIC as facilitator. CESRIC also contributes to the development efforts of individual member countries by supporting disadvantaged groups such as refugees and asylum seekers through specific projects aimed at developing vocational and entrepreneurial skills. While facilitating the transfer of knowledge and experience among the relevant institutions in the member countries, CESRIC maintains a dynamic partnership with various relevant stakeholders, including government entities, international institutions, non-government organizations, as well as the private sector. Initiating and implementing various new cooperation modalities, CESRIC will continue to support the sustainable development efforts of the OIC member states with a view to enhancing the solidarity and prosperity of the member countries and the Muslim Ummah at large. The Islamic Development Bank has been a symbol of trust, credibility, strength and stability for over 44 years. As we build on our successes of the past, we look to the future. A future of growth. Empowering communities to drive their own economic and social progress at scale. Investing in the infrastructure that enables them to fulfill their potential. Building collaborative partnerships between public and private sectors, communities and nations. Supporting science, technology and innovation-led solutions which aid the UN Sustainable Development Goals.
university in the city of civilizations, Istanbul, from proud past to bright future. Among the world's top 500 sustainable universities, Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University prepares its students for illustration careers with its experienced academic staff, cutting-edge classrooms, technological research infrastructure, international collaborations, and diverse educational opportunities. Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University is the proud winner of Good Governance and Green Campus Cambridge IFA 3G Award in the year 2020. Our next winner comes from the higher education sector. The Istanbul Sabatin Zayn University is the proud winner of the 3G University Campus of the Year 2020. Welcome. My name is Mehmet Bulut and I am Director of Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, an international research university with over 11,000 students, 4,000 of whom are postgraduate students. Just last year, we were listed in top 500 sustainable university campuses around the world by Green Metrics. Our scholars are proud pioneers in the field of Islamic economics and finance, halal industry, political science and international relations. We believe in social responsibility and public service to humanity. In this spirit, we provide full sponsored education to students from the regional conflict zones to all of the world. Our university grows day by day, featuring a diverse community from more than 95 countries in a large, beautiful green campus with a minimal carbon footprint with over 60 square kilometers set aside for sustainable agriculture. We believe in that the most important capital and value is well-educated young generation. From our noble past to bright future, we are trying to do our best on higher education. Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University is an international research university with over 10,000 students and an international student body hailing from over 87 countries to pursue degrees from among Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University's expensive selection of undergraduate and graduate programs. Science, Exploration, Innovation, Art, Sports, History, Nature. The gates of the past that open into the future lay on this campus. Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University. Islamic economics is the collection of rules, values and standards of conduct that organize economic life and establish relations of production in an Islamic society. These rules and standards are based on the Islamic order as recognized in the Quran and Sana and the corpus of jurisprudence which was developed over the last 1400 years by thousands of jurists and academicians responding to the changing circumstances and evolving life of Muslims all over the globe. The International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance is the world's largest organization that enables its quest to be conducted in an academic environment. The International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance series have started in 1976. This series are considered among the most prestigious academic events in the field of Islamic economics and finance. In the last 45 years, significant contributions to both theory and practice of contemporary Islamic economics and finance have been realized through research and intellectual dialogue. It was held in Makkah, Saudi Arabia and organized by the King Abdulaziz University. It was organized by International Islamic University and participants came together in Islamabad, Pakistan. The conference moved into a different continent and held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The organizer was International Islamic University, Malaysia. The fourth conference was held in Loughborough, United Kingdom, and for the first time, it was being officially recognized by Western academic world. The name of the conference series has been changed, and it became International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance. Fifth conference, with its new name, was held in Bahrain by the Organization of Bahrain University. 
It was held in Jakarta, Indonesia, and jointly organized by Indonesian Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank of Indonesia. By the seventh conference, a new session has been included. Hereupon, an Islamic Economics and Finance Education Symposium during the conference has been held as well. The organizer of the seventh conference was King Abdulaziz University and it took place in Jada, Saudi Arabia. Eighth conference was the beginning of a new trend because more than 100 papers presented during the conference. It was jointly organized by Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies and the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries and held in Doha, Qatar. Similar to 8th conference, 9th conference was one of the most productive events in the history of the series. In total, these two conferences have produced 5 English volumes and 2 Arabic volumes of the papers presented. 9th conference was held in Istanbul, Turkey and organized by the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries. After two years, Doha became the host of the conference again. Tenth conference was jointly organized by Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies and Economic and Social Research and Training Center of Islamic Countries. The final stop of the series was Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and International Islamic University, Malaysia with Islamic Research and Training Institute and International Association for Islamic Economics undertook the organization. There are some cities that can welcome all in its rich culture and heritage. It can unite continents, oceans, roads and give life to business. Even at the age of 8500, they continue to inspire the world. Istanbul is one such city, the seat of three great empires, a city that embraces two continents and welcomes the sea at its heart. Istanbul is the only city to maintain its stance as an economic center in every period of history. Currently, Istanbul is standing out as the major economic center of the country with a GNP share of approximately 23%. Almost all the headquarters of insurance, leasing, factoring companies and private finance firms are based in Istanbul. The Istanbul Stock Exchange, established as a free zone, is rapidly rising as one of the significant markets of the world. This great historical city is redefining itself as international finance, real estate and tourism destination. In phase with previous conferences held in different parts of the world and organized by esteemed institutions, for the second time, the conference is taking place in Istanbul, Turkey under the team Sustainable Development for Real Economy. Twelfth Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance will provide a platform for dialogue and discussions between policymakers, academicians, researchers, graduate students and practitioners to address the problems of sustainable development in the fourth industrial revolution era from the perspective of Islamic economics and finance. It has been jointly organized by Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, Islamic Research and Training Institute, International Association for Islamic Economics, Hamad bin Khalifa University and Participation Banks Association of Turkey. Finally, we would like to express our thanks to each order of 132 papers that will be presented during the conference. Welcome to 12th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance. Our world today is full of opportunity, but it's also full of challenges, both to business and to investment. For countries to develop their economies, achieve their sustainable development goals and create new jobs, they need to have access to finance and be able to mitigate political and commercial risk.
Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. Yes, this is Ahmed Faruk Aysan. Uh, I am uh, I am an economist at Istanbul Şehir University. Uh, I'm the Dean of Management and Administrative Sciences. Uh, so I'm very glad to have you uh, all here and to be uh, the chair of this session. So I'm lucky to uh, be a chair at the session. All papers are related with the sustainable development goals. I have been working on those issues in the last two, three years. And that seemed to be uh, quite a uh, most recent topic for, uh, for many Islamic economists, because Islamic economics seem to uh, moving towards more on the sustainability side. We observe that after 2008 global crisis, there's an increasing resurgent attention to Islamic finance, but it was more from the financial perspective and people were interested in why Islamic banks have performed better than the conventional banks. And we, we have seen very good papers written by the conventional economists and finance people also. Uh, to understand the Islamic economics. But fortunately or unfortunately, that wave has changed. Uh, 2008 crisis has been away from us for about 12 years, even though we have discussed and we see the repercussions of those uh, this crisis. But now we have now different crises, including COVID-19. And as mm -hmm. well as I observe in the last uh, three, four, five years probably, there is much more emphasis on sustainability in Islamic finance. Many of my friends uh, are focusing more on the sustainability issues. It seems to be more of a universal language right now. And many people are writing papers. And I'm glad to be uh, chair in this session because this is uh, one of the most uh, up-to-date topic probably because some of the papers discussed in the conference are relatively uh, quite good for sure. But uh, in terms of the popularity in terms of speaking out the language with the others, uh, sustainability issues, sustainable development goals will be quite important. Before I go on uh, giving uh, uh, voice to you, uh, let me uh, emphasize that the sustainability issues will be with us in the upcoming years, uh, not just because of our efforts, not just because of our efforts uh, of organizing this sort of conferences, but because of the global agenda. And I believe that especially after COVID-19, we will discuss more of sustainable issues, sustainability related issues. And I believe that United Nations, especially UNDV, is doing a great job in terms of advertising, in terms of making the SDGs as uh, more prevalent in mainstream discussions. This is not just in Islamic economics, but in conventional economics, we uh, see more of discussions on sustainability. I believe that uh, that could be a good opportunity for Islamic economics and finance people, because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, Islamic economics is still considered to be some kind of a marginal field. Uh, when we submit our papers to conventional journals, uh, some of the journals completely reject that, reject uh, Islamic finance, Islamic economics related papers because uh, some of them even do not believe that there is such a field. But the good thing is uh, that uh, the sustainability might be a common language that they will be more open and it could be a very good opportunity for also for people working on Islamic finance to use more universal language and to make the, some of the subjects that we already discussed in Islamic economics uh, to be discussed in the mainstream agenda and to make Islamic economics, ethics, sustainability issues more re relevant for policymakers, for more conventional academics. We have actually tried this before when Turkey was having the G20 presidency back in 2015, we organized an Islamic economics conference as a part of the G20 agenda. Uh, and then we continue on doing it in 2016 as well. And in there, we invited very conventional people into our conferences, academics, policymakers. Even we have invited Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner on Islamic economics. He talked about the good society. He talked about the, uh, uh, his way of behavioral approach to economics, the ethical issues, and it was quite well received. So I also believe that we have to incorporate 
uh, the conventional people into Islamic economics and the sustainability discussions could be one of the good channel. It could be a good language. It could be a good narrative for all of us. So I consider that this is a great opportunity and I consider this session as a great opportunity also because this is one of the very few sessions that we start discussing about sustainable development goals. So I believe this is a historical moment and we will see more of those discussions. And I'm very glad to have you all uh, to, uh, and, uh, to discuss the, the sustainability issues. So without further ado, I have a lot to say probably. Uh, we, are, we are writing a paper on this, about this language of sustainability and Islamic economics, how they are related, how uh, uh, the language formation, the narratives could be quite important in the spread of the ideas. Uh, so hopefully it will come out and uh, we will have the chance to discuss it further. But I know I'm the chair. I'm not supposed to take too much of your time, which I have already taken about five, six minutes. So that means that uh, we have 90 minutes. Uh, we have five presenters. Uh, that means that we have about, let's say, 12 minutes because we want to allow time for the discussions. And also I warn you that uh, nobody will listen to you after a while even though your paper is quite interesting. And I know that you think your paper is quite interesting, but what does matter is whether the audience thinks so. And after a while, especially this sort of webinars, uh, the attention is lost after a while. So I believe 12 minutes is a good uh, time to allocate because you are going to be talking about 12 minutes and people might lose attention. So I will give you 12 minutes each and we will get the questions at the end. Given that we have also our YouTube channel and we will get the questions, it's not like regular uh, conferences that 10, 15 people come up and they ask questions, probably we will have more questions anyway. So without further ado, I will give the, and there is, there is also the technology help sometimes. I have the privilege to uh, mute your voice. So if you exceed 12 minutes, uh, then uh, for the sustainability of the panel, I will let the others, uh, to let the others talk. I will meet you after 12 minutes. So we will start with Ramota Uzif. Uh, without further ado, we are starting at 12.40 and you have 12 minutes. Please, the uh, floor is yours. Ramota, right. uh, yes, yes, Prof. your presentation is here. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. We appreciate your experience in this area. Auz billahi mina shaitanur rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanur Rahim. I want to start with the best Islam greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wow. My, topic, my, my topic for this discussion is financial inclusion, the role of Islamic finance in achieving sustainable development goals. And this is the roadmap for the study. Um, introduction, Islam finance is considered as an alternative form of finance to the conventional um, finance by economies of the world. This was all well pronounced after the global crisis of 2007-2008, when it was able to withstand the shock compared to the conventional financial system. Islamic finance is defined as the provision of financial services in accordance to the Sharia law. There is a very big and vast difference between Islamic finance and the conventional financial system. As the conventional financial system has uh, deal with um, interest and also is based on um, individual's economic problems or realization of men's problem. Islamic financial system has to do with what? Interest-free. There is no interest attached to this kind of uh, banking or uh, financing. And also it is what? Profit sharing and cost sharing. The problem or the reason why this study was conducted or the research cap for the study has to do with worldwide, especially in a less developed and underdeveloped countries. There is what people are facing abject poverty. There is lack of food, shelter, clothing among the poor and also health, um, poor healthcare facilities is also what another problem that has been identified. And because of these reasons, the world leaders had to come up what, with a meeting and they discussed to bring out 17 different goals which they, that was in 2015 with the aim of achieving these goals by 2030. So the lack of studies on how to translate Islamic finance towards SDG achievement and also the integration, how to integrate Islamic finance into solving SDG problems and the neglect of financial uh, Islamic finance towards achieving SDG goals, mistreatment of Islamic finance, all are what parts of 
the reasons why this study was conducted. So the research objective has to do with that Islamic finance, what is the, the first uh, research objective examines the role of Islamic finance towards achieving sustainable development goals. And it also wants to investigate the relationship between financial inclusion and Islamic finance. They also, it also discussed the initiative that Islamic social instrument is undertaking to achieving SDGs and also the various role of what Islamic financial instruments and their role in achieving SDGs. So these questions were asked, what is the role of Islamic finance towards achieving SDGs and what is the relationship between financial inclusion, Islamic finance and SDGs? And also what are the various Islamic financial instruments role towards achieving SDGs? literature has been reviewed, few among them is that Habib and Co. 2015, they argue that Islamic finance has a positive and strong potential in promoting financial inclusion, financial stability, shared prosperity, and infrastructure development, which helps set an enabling environment for the timely implementation of SDGs. Sadiq and Chopra 2019 also argue that Islamic finance, that is the non-interest banking that we're all talking about ensures that financial ensures financial stability because they exercise more market discipline it is based on ethical values regulated financial innovativeness as well as asset backing and that then that is why they are not totally destabilized during any financial shock methodology this kind of data that was used for this particular study was mainly secondary data Different literatures were reviewed from different book, uh, uh, journals, for different book, different articles, and other sources of finance, the, uh, other sources of literature that was used for this study include the International Development Bank website, United Nations website, and the Holy Quran and Hadith, Hadith. Discussions. Sustainable development goals, as we all know, which was formed in 2015 with the aim of being achieved in 2015, and is 17 in number. This table explains or give the detail of these SDGs. That is, SDG 1 is talking about no poverty by 2013. There shouldn't be anger by 2013. We should acquire good health and well being. And the last one is talking about partnership for Come all. Voice. Hello? Financial inclusion contribution. What is the uh, contribution of financial inclusion so far as this study is concerned. Financial inclusion help what in credit accessibility, income generation, it creates employment and it helps in poverty reduction. And what is the relationship between financial inclusion and SDGs? As we can see from um, the role or the contribution and significance of financial inclusion, which has to do with creating employment and reducing poverty. When it comes to the goals, some of the goals as indicated here, uh, no poverty, zero anger, good health and reducing inequalities. All these are contributions and role of what? Financial inclusion. And there is a strong and positive relationship between SDGs and financial inclusion. And Islamic finance also contributes to what? Sound corporate governance, ethical, product, ethical products and services, interest-free banking, and it gets what? Create job for the poor, reduce their poverty level and income generating activities, whilst risk management wasn't an exception so far as contribution of um, financial, uh, Islamic finance is what? Um, considered. And then we have to also look at what is Islamic financial instruments, since it's one of the research questions. So what are the what Islamic financial instruments? And these instruments include the Skuk, the Takaful, Modoraba, Musharaka, Modoraba, Musharaka, Istisna, Ejara, and Takaful. As this table indicated, most of the financial instruments used in Islamic financing. And these Islamic financial instruments can be divided into fixed income mode and equity mode. While Moraba, Mudoraba, Musharaka, and Sukuk, which is loan list and debt financing, fall under the fixed income mode, then Mudoraba and Musharaka also falls under the equity mode. Then we also have the Islamic social distribution instruments, which is what, which are which comprise the Zakat, the Sadaqa, the Park, and Qad al Hassan. This table illustrates most of the social redistribution instruments in Islamic financing. So, what is the role of Islamic finance towards achieving SDGs? As indicated by SDG zero, uh, SDG one, and SDG two, the goal is to end poverty. And according to UNDP 2015, more than 800 million people worldwide live less than $1.5 per day, which shows what abject poverty. And also, there is what a gap. And also, there is a strong 
um, poverty being realized by the um, poor people. And we can also do away with anger. Uh, this, uh, how do you call it, poverty leads to what? A lot of anger. A lot of people were what, suffering from anger. Anger is prevalent in most of these countries and more endemic in what? Developing countries. So how can this what um, problem or this deem in SDG be what? Um, solved through Islamic financing? The issue is that the gap can be closed through Islamic finance adoption. And by using this zakat, sadaqat work, which is shared to the poor household. And we also look at what the uh, SDG 8, which talks about the employment, uh, sorry, which also talk about the economic development. And the role of Islamic finance in economic development can never be downplayed. Islamic finance is done through the following instruments. That is the Mudoraba, Mushoraka, Sukuk, Takaful, and the other. And when we talk of climate change, what role has that one got to do with SDG 13, SDG 14, and SDG 14? Yeah, there's a strong literature that indicates that on the 20th of January 2016, the UN, the United Nations Environmental Program and the Islamic Development Fund signed an agreement on observation of environment, environment towards supporting the SDGs and fighting the climate change. This were trying to prove the highest commitment of Islamic finance through the APS Islamic institution regulating all other services. So what is the relationship between um, financial inclusion, Islamic finance, and SDGs? And as this table indicated, Islamic finance, which we divided into the social instrument and financial instrument, of course, has a strong dealings with what SDGs. They help what re, um, solve the problem of SDGs and also the financial inclusion, which is through the development program, financing program, SME, prog SME programs, and microfinance institutions. Also through the uh, through these institutions, the uh, um, uh, how do you call it? The, the Islamic finance was able to what uh, issued products and services that are ethical, that are interest free to their customers, and through that the SDGs what will will be what achieve. So what are the challenges towards achieving these goals? Of course, we face what inadequate legal framework, poor re financial regulations. And then what? Low public awareness. A lot of countries, especially in countries where we have less Muslims, people are not even aware of Islamic finances. So this is what a problem. To summarize this work, Islamic finance institutions have a great role to play in the process to offer funds required for new projects. Also, countries with strong financial institutions are in advance in reaching their SDGs. And it was also discovered that Malaysia is today the largest Islamic macrofinance in, uh, in sustainable development in Asia. And to conclude, Islamic finance can surely play a vital role, especially in what? SDG number eight. Through the Islamic financial instrument like Sukuk, Mudoraba, Musharaka, Takaful, of course, it is likely to do what achieve, or we are likely to achieve our SDGs. And also the Islamic social distribution instruments such as the Zakat and Wafqaf, through that, we are likely to what the poor are able to uh, get some funds, invest this money, or use this money to do petty businesses, income generating activities, get profits, and through that, their poverty level will be reduced, and there will be what economic development and SDG can be achieved by 2013. So therefore, we recommend that they should be what established. They should be established. They should, we should be able to establish an enabling environment. Regulatory and supervisory framework should be strengthened, and there should be the need for joint collaborative research and development. Digital financial services and other financial instruments must be provided, and there should be there should be the need to come up with a practical solutions and to work together. Other instruments for liquidity management needs to be developed, and old, new, and emerging models needs to be what integrated. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramuta. It is great. Uh, you are very timely. So we will get the questions at the end, as I mentioned at the beginning. So OK, bro. OK, thank you very much. Let's move thank to the you. next presentation. Uh, who is next? I, I need to check. Who is next? Who knows? This is Mustafa. OK, please, uh, Dr. Mustafa, please go ahead. You Let have me share my screen. Yes, I will share first my screen. Yes, please. Thanks to Mrs. Ramuta. You are very timely. So we expect the same performance from Dr. Mustafa too. Thank you very Inshallah. much. Inshallah. 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 Okay. Do you see my screen, sir? Yeah, yeah. Please okay. go ahead. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
Ve ma tevfik illa billah aleyhi tevekkeltü ve aleyhi unit. Sadakallahu lazim. Esselatu vesselamu aleyke ya Resulallah. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. Distinguished participants of 20th International Conference. I'm greeting you from Konya, the host city of the great scholar Mevlana Celaleddin Rumi. My name is Mustafa Helvacıoğlu. I am a civil engineer with a master's degree on transport and sustainable development. Currently, I am a PhD student on Islamic economics and finance program at Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University. First of all, I'm sending my special thanks to Professor Mehmet Bulut, Rector of uh, IZU, uh, Assistant Professor Muhammad Sharif Al Amri, and uh, Assistant Professor Mustafa Omar Muhammad uh, for their very valuable encouragement, guidance, and contribution in this research. Today, I will present you a critical analysis of the economic dimension of sustainable development goals based on the Islamic economics perspective. Initially, I will take you to a historical thinking to understand the Western origins of sustainable development and introduce the topic. Later, I will state the problem and give the objectives. Then I will tell the methodology and touch to the literature review. Later, we will discuss our findings. And lastly, I will conclude my presentation, including recommendations. When I was learning sustainable development as a master's student in United Kingdom in 2004, I was sure this uh, idea and its related activities would offer solutions to the problems of the world. However, after 15 years, I discovered that there are gaps in this concept, especially when it comes to the method of achieving its goals. The gap comes from its Western origins. We all know that sustainable development is introduced world by the uh, Western, but indeed it was not an innovation, but a cause and effect process. Therefore, in order to make any constructive critical analysis on this concept, we need to first uh, clearly understand its Western origins. Here I present to you the trend of sustainable development in late 19th century as a result of new imperialism and uh, industrialization. Those industrialized Western nations penetrated in Asian and African continents and exploited the natural resources with a colonial context. In early 20th century, following the social, economic and environmental destructions of first and second world wars, the rise in the need of fossil fuels made Western economies develop policies in securing energy flow for their continuous heavy industries. In 1940s, therefore, a consensus emerged in the Western world on the uh, emergence of uh, er, emergence of the uh, urgent need of the for international efforts to the to aid the development of less advanced countries. This aid increased the material well-being and also uh, transport, transformed the in, uh, institutional structure of other countries. The flow of goods and services were promoted and improved in the mid 20th century. And that's why uh, that's what they call the economic growth. And it became the major goals of the West. On the other hand, it was introduced as a success named economic development to be followed by the less advanced countries. When we arrived in 1916s, uh, international trade became the key implementation of economic development and Western countries started providing large scale legal, technical and financial assistance to those less advanced countries. Unfortunately, that was the time when economic well-being was traded off with the environmental and social well-being. And as a result of this, many environmental and social protests and movements rise. The United Nations couldn't stand on these movements and therefore for the first time they organized a global summit that considers human impacts on the environment in 1972. After 10 years, World Commission on Environment and Development and Center for Our Common Future uh, institutions are founded. Uh, they, were, uh, th they were announcing a new era uh, of economic growth that shall ensure social and environmental sustainability at the same time. Uh, and uh, this famous Brooklyn report was also published in 1982 during this period. 
The journey of sustainable development started from theory to practice after Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, followed by Agenda 21, which was a practice plan of sustainable development principles. Commission on Sustainable Development was established for providing guidance and tracking the progress of implementation of sustainable development. On the other hand, inside box economic and financial reforms created modern Great Depressions with severe and continuous economic and financial crisis, crisis in the beginning of new millennia. Eight millennium development goals to be achieved globally by 2015 uh, were introduced, but it, they were not sound because of those crises. That's why they are expanded and named as Sustainable Development Goals, which we know today. In the United Nations World Summit uh, in 2012, they are introduced uh, without waiting for 2015, uh, and Sustainable Development Goals have a tracking period until the end of 2030. So now we have 10 years uh, for these global measures. We may now expect to have some fundamental global changes uh, after 2020, especially because of the COVID-19. So issues of social health care, uh, effects of digitalism and rising trade wars between East and West may force us to amend these defini the definition scope and collaboration of sustainable development goals. If we sum up what we went through, we can say the Western world took interest in the reinventing sustainable development at the end of 20th century. Uh, sustainable development is not a new concept to Islam. It has been practiced on its main sources for ages. But because of the institutional change, the Western concept of sustainable development was the one that later imported and adopted by Muslim governments. Because uh, by the end of the uh, uh, ending the Ottoman Empire, this transformation started and it gets, gets uh, faster and broader among Muslim societies where they were relying on the Western ideas and innovations only and relegated to sustainable development in Islam from original institutional structure to a uh, level of in, uh, individual level. So in this last 10 years, we believe uh, Islamic economics shall take the opportunity, uh, opportunity to reevaluate and promote the sustainable development from Islamic economics perspective, which covers both human, human social relationships and human nature environmental relationships. So the problem is today's concept of sustainable development is discovered through trial and errors emanating from Western practices and failures. If we if people look at the concept of sustainable development only from the Western thinkers perspective, sustainable development goals cannot be achieved. Sustainable development goals uh, from the Western perspective often focus on the material achievement and neglecting the ethical process. Uh, we offer, we say that if we deal with the economic dimension of sustainable development goals by developing a new inclusive model based on Islamic economics, we can examine the extent of the ills in the practices of conventional economics and finance on sustainable development goals, and thus offer genuine economic and financial solutions based on Islamic economics, which in practice is human centric and has a clear ethical frame for all humans. Our objective is to examine Islamic economics and its financial solutions to institutions in the context of sustainable development goals. We are aiming to attract attentions of Islamic state governments, Muslim communities and Muslim business world and the Islamic financial sector, harness their potential to contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goals. For helping institutions, we are redefining sustainable development and recategorizing sustainable development goals based on Islamic economics perspective. And we are showing the way to assess sustainable development goals in relation to Islamic economics in our paper. As a, uh, a literature review, uh, I will skip this part uh, quickly, but uh, we grouped the literature under three uh, headers. The first group was mostly uh, uh, focusing on the concept of sustainable development, and they were mostly written by the Western writers. And the second group consists of mostly official NGO reports and analysis. And lastly, the third group, which was uh, written mostly by the Muslim uh, authors, uh, was giving the idea of Islam and sustainable development uh, harmonization. Mm. 
The gap in the literature is uh, we saw that there are few works uh, this, uh, that discuss Islam and sustainable development, uh, specifically on the SDGs. Uh, there are hardly any work that discuss SDGs, particularly on the economic dimension from Islamic economics perspective. Uh, we believe such a study is important to analyze the extent of similarities and differences between sustainable development goal and Islamic economics perspective. As a methodology, uh, the study has Papa, adopted. Papa, you have only two yeah. minutes and you are still in the methodology part. So you better come to the conclusion. You, okay, are, sir. you are out of time. Okay, as a key finding, uh, we can say that uh, the, the 17 goals are already uh, uh, worked by the Islamic economic systems. But what uh, Islamic economic, sorry, all Islamic economic uh, or other uh, economic system, but what uh, Islamic economic system offers is establishing economic justice and being respectful to, to human dignity as a unique objective. So we are offering a three step assessment the concept of needs, the concept of limitations, and the concept of objectives, where uh, the concept of, for instance, the sustainable development introduces the concept of need as the essential. It is similar that in Islamic economics, there is the necessities mentioned in Sharia that should be uh, the basic need of the human being. Uh, with this uh, three assessment tool, we can uh, uh, create some set of questions and gradings in our uh, evaluation. And uh, as a result, we are defining sustainable development like this. The development, sustainable development is the development that sustains the necessities of the present and the future by seeking and conducting the activities permissible by Islamic law. And when we categorize the uh, sustainable development goals from the Islamic economics perspective, we can say SDG 9, 8, 3, 10, 1, and 12 can be considered economic uh, under this. Uh, so that, that uh, the institutions can focus on this uh, in Islamic economics uh, uh, part. As a conclusion, the origins of sustainable development by tracking its Western world motives and pointed out the reasons of the Islamic world, adopting late to this concept. Principles of Islamic economics and the principles of sustainable development well suits, especially in the uh, economic side. Based on the supportive concepts between SDGs and Islamic economics, a three-step assessment process is suggested in our paper. We are redefining SDG as sustainable development and uh, uh, categorizing just to focus and uh, uh, re-understand it. And uh, we, we think that there is a huge area for Islamic economics for reflecting and highlighting its harmonization with sustainable development through working on SDGs. As a recommendation, what we say, SDGs will, and sustainable development will uh, see its golden age by the contribution of Islamic economics, but it is a, a, a mutual uh, benefit where when Islamic economic contributes more on the SDGs, SDGs will also uh, promote Islamic economics worldwide and globally, and people will, uh, the awareness of, on the Islamic economics will increase, uh, hopefully. So we can conclude our last uh, slide that after 2030, hopefully the results of Islamic economics contribution will be a good benchmark for everyone uh, all over the world and the effective area of uh, Islamic economics will increase. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and for your patience. Thank you, thank you very much, Mustafa el -Bajolo. That was great. I was a bit concerned when I see the literature review, just two minutes. <laughs> It's great. Thank you. Well, a great job. Thank you. So, without further ado, let's move to the next presentation. Professor Mansur Afifi, I guess the turn is yours. You have 12 minutes. Yes. Uh, I will share my presentation. Okay. Yeah, it's coming up. Yes, we do see it. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to present my paper and a great uh, one from a greeting from Lombok, Indonesia, uh, the island of paradise. 
my, in my paper entitled Contribution of Islamic Economics in Supporting the Achievements of Sustainable Development Goals, we will discuss a result of, of our uh, long-term and consecutive research in natural resources management. And my presentation, presentation will consist of uh, aspects from introduction to concluding remarks. Let's begin with introduction. Uh, Indonesia has experienced a massive devastating and degradation of uh, the environment and natural resources in the last three decades. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, Indonesia was the country in South and Southeast Asia, which had the greatest rate of forest loss. As a result, natural catastrophes such as abrasion, flooding, and landslide occur in many parts of Indonesia when the rainy season comes. Indonesia has been overtaken by the worst flood in Southeast Asia since 2007. Uh, Indonesia also has lost their uh, forests uh, during uh, while, uh, within the five uh, years. Indonesia uh, forest cover has reduced by 2.7 billion million hectares, and also we experience a coral reef destruction in Indonesia. Only 5.6 percent of coral reef are in very good condition, and there the rest in good, fair, and, and bad condition. Uh, this is the cases of damage to natural resources consists of many aspects, including management, uh, public policies, um, institutional arrangement, economic development, law enforcement, human activities, and social economic factors. However, the destruction of natural resources and environment is largely caused by human activities. Uh, interesting finding of our research is that there is a close relation and significant relationship between one's worship activities and his behavior to coral reef. The more obedient a person in performing ritual uh, worship is the better is his behavior in dealing with human and their environment. Uh, the study shows that religious value and norm contribute greatly to the establishment of human civilization because these values and norm both encourage and inspire people to maintain their relationships with human and their environments. And the second one that we find is greed and ignorance is a part of community manner and behavior. So they, they, they um, destructs or uh, destroy their environment. And, and um, we can conclude from the study that the destruction of natural resources is influenced by the behavior of people involved in natural resource management activities, both legal and illegal. Therefore, the objectives of uh, my paper is, first of all, to find the emanating of the structured behavior by elaborating on the principles of neoclassical economics theory. And the second one is to demonstrate the Islamic values, which are considered to be more suitable as well as compatible with the effort to achieve sustainable development goals, especially goals number 14, uh, life below water, and goal number 15, life on on land. <clears throat> A criticism of conventional economics. Uh, the study of natural resources management is a part of the study of economic, specifically the economic of natural resources and environment. Economics theories and paradigms form the basis for analyzing various aspects of natural resources management and the environment. Therefore, if we now see the chaotic management of natural resources, it can be perceived as a pillar of economic, especially conventional economics. Uh, we are very common with the concept of scarcity. Scarcity is the main economic problem that 
will be overcome by conventional economic theory. The limitation of go goods and services where will surely cause competition among individuals to obtain them. In conventional economic perspective, humans are seen as utilitarian. The more they have, the better. Uh, enjoy luxury, things of themselves, or individualist, rational, independent, and non-cooperative. All activities carried by, uh, by human are driven by his interest. From there come the phrase, more is better and greedy is good, which show that humans always want to maximize utility by consuming as much as, much as possible. The basic principle of um, capitalism is that human behavior is based on the desire for something. Modern economic theories explain the behavior of individuals who mix up the economy based on principles such as people respond to incentive and rational people things at the margin. These two theories explain that the, uh, the de uh, decision, uh, decision made by individual is greatly influenced by how much profit he will get. And criticism and dissatisfaction with conventional economic doctrines and paradigms emerge from many academicians. They present not only criticism and rebuttal, but also offer alternative thoughts, concepts, and methods to solve various economic problems at various levels. They propose alternative for conventional economics, including institutional economics, uh, normative and positive economics, and people economics. Uh, conventional economics has failed in shaping humanitarian goals by putting uh, justice and public welfare on it. This failure is caused by the conventional economics reluctant on value-based judgment and excessive concentration on maximizing wealth, satisfying desires and individualistic attitudes. As far as social interests are concerned, conventional economists generally assume that competition will encourage the fulfillment of personal interests and subsequently meet social interests. To prevent wrong action and injustice as well as to develop well-being, it is needed moral values that can motivate humans to make sacrifice. Therefore, values derived from religions are relevant to be internalized in the analysis of economic theory. These values that Islam nurtures, including generosity, cooperation, honesty, trust, justice, and social responsibility. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> failure will prevent negative economic practices such as monopoly, hoarding, speculation, gambling, and usury. Uh, Islam also criticizes the concept of scarcity because uh, in Islamic uh, teaching, resources are not scarce because God created them in sufficient quantities, like in the Surah Al Furqan, verse 2. That means that uh, God created everything and then ordains for it a measure. Mahatma Gandhi also denied the concept of scarcity by saying that the earth has enough for every man's need, but not for every man's greed. In Islamic teaching, the earth was created by uh, Allah and Allah gave power to human to manage or become caliph on the earth. Caliph, uh, the function of caliph as manager, user, utilizer, maintainer, and preserves so that human must not destroy nature because the consequences will return to, to human. And also uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that uh, in many hadiths that for example, I will put a pipe of, uh, of what he says here. Uh, the earth is green and beautiful and Allah has appointed you, his servants, his caliph, to reach there. And Allah sees how you release yourself. Do not cut down cedar trees in the desert when animals find shelters. Uh, 
and one's branch of faith is to throw garbage from the road when in the last hours of the day of judgment if one of us holds a plan in hand we must plan it and the last maybe in this occasion uh, last hadith every muslim who plans or cultivates plan and eat from them or other people animal or bird eat from them will receive a gift from what we should give for that from allah the implication of the islamic teaching is that muslim must be a lover of environments religious concept of conservation and sustainable management of natural resources need to be translated to practice there are three islamic principles in natural conservation we call hima management zone designated for sustainable use of natural resources uh, and harem nature reserve used to protect water resources and environmental services and ihya al mawad encourage the piping abandoned land to be productive and from this um, <clears throat> Uh, discussion and idea we can come to conclusion that the destructive behavior is a result of the few values norm adopted by human that are not in line with the effort to preserve natural resources and environments and the second one is the idea of resource scarcity competition free market utilitarian maximum utility highest economic growth which are a part of neoclassical economic teachings could be considered as a source of those destructive manners the third one is that the value taught by islam are more suitable and supportive of the effort to preserve the environments and natural resources therefore to support the achievement of the sustainable development goal especially goals number 14 and 15 life below water and life on land islamic values and views need to be instilled not only in the community but also in the decision maker thank you for your kind attention a shukur a dream assalamu alaikum thank you very much professor mansur it is great to have your contribution from indonesia definitely it's a marvelous country uh, and uh, there are a lot to be done in practice on sustainability I am at the advisory committee of the Central Bank of Indonesia, Bank Indonesia, on their journals. Uh, and I know there is a sincere effort for, on Islamic finance, on sustainability, on central banking issues. So great to have your contribution. It will be great to see also some applications of what Indonesia has done on sustainability, uh, because this seems to be some sort of a start, theoretical background. But it will be great to see with such an inspired by the Islamic values, what the policymakers, what the people over there are doing on sustainability and changing the life of the people, changing the uh, destiny of the earth probably, or uh, destiny is predetermined anyway, but helping to contribute for sustainability from an Islamic perspective. So thank you very much for this uh, contribution. Uh, more of a theoretical contribution. I hope to see more on the practical side of what the Indonesians have done or will be doing, inshallah, in the future. Thank you very much. Without further ado, who is next? Rani, you are the next, I guess. Dr. Rani, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you, Prof. Ahmed. Prof. I will deliver yeah. the... Yeah. Introduce After... yourself. I guess it is good to... I, I don't know you much anyway. I just know yes. you... Uh, please just one minute. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Prof. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Ahmed. My name is Rani Puspitanirum. I was the lecturer of Maliku Saleh University in Lok Sumawi Aceh, and I was uh, master degree holder from Erlangga University Surabaya. Now I live in Lok Sumawi Aceh, and uh, within this chance, I would like to deliver my ordinary research actually. For you, I hope uh, this is a more practical implementation of SDGs in Indonesia. I hope so. Okay, I will uh, start to uh, sharing a presentation or PowerPoint. Can I? Yeah, yeah please, please go ahead. Floor is yours.
Okay. Uh, today I would like, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh all. Today I would like to deliver the summary of the paper entitled with the role of Islamic financial development goal to accomplish sustainable development goals in Indonesia. Next. Uh, now in this first uh, time I would like to uh, I would like to talk about a little why this why this research is important in the area of Islamic economic and finance related to the sustainable development goals. Uh, we know that the Islamic finance is the latest euphoria as a solution to the failure of the conventional economic and financial system that we best knew more to human rationality in maximizing profit, but ignores the aspect of sustainability, sustainability that meets the needs and welfare of all humanity. It is proven that the maximization of profit that ignores sustainability raises a series of problems at the world level uh, that the United Nation or UNDP summarized in the framework of 17 sustainable development goals. Islamic finance in consider, uh, Islamic finance is considered in line with the sustainable development goals seen from the principle of justice, is sharing and direct link each with real economy and avoided, avoidance of excessive speculation. So the financial service sector in particular will achieve greater stability and sustainable growth trajectory. Uh, in the in the other words, that Islamic finance is uh, has a strong potential promoting financial stability, financial inclusion, and share prosperity and infrastructure development, which will set at an enabling environment for timely implementation of SDGs. Uh, sustainable development is the latest challenge faced by development and developing countries around the world. Well, the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987 presented the definition of sustainable development focusing on intergeneralization, intergenerational equity concept in its view such development is that as meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Okay, the, defi the definition, those definition approach of the commission is largely in consonance with the Mako sheet or objective of the Sharia. The main objective of the Islamic law put broadly are to promote the well-being of male, all mankind which lies in safeguarding their feet, their human self, their intellect, their posterity, and their wealth. Islamic finance aims to promote an economic concept that extends beyond being the component of a financial system, but as a part of a total value-based social system through principle of the Makoshi Sharia. The implementation of the Makoshi Sharia that inspired the Islamic financial development in, assess, in achieving Sustainable development by the United Nations is translated into, into seven sustainable development goals. Some of them are very closely represent the values of the Makassit Sharia, which is namely goals number one is to promote poverty reduction in all its form. And then number eight, to promote sustain, uh, inclusive, sustainable, and decent work for all. And then uh, number 13 is to take the urgent action to combat climate change. So the debate about the role of Islamic financial development on sustainable development was discussed separately by several previous studies. They conclude that the Islamic financial development and uh, play an important role in achieving of the of the three, uh, three, uh, three SDGs target. However, this research did not mention specifically mention the role of Islamic financial instruments such as financing and suku in achieving SDGs. So I thought it is the important research gap, and I will and I think the I think the study aims to collaborate on the role of Islamic financial development in both two financial sector, financial sector uh, indicator, namely financing by Islamic banks and suku in accomplish the sustainable development goals in Indonesia, the development of financing and suku aspect to be able to assist the Indonesian state in achieving three three important SDGs target uh, on poverty reduction, economic growth, and climate action. And to bring Indonesia uh, state as one of the sustainable development countries pilot project that have succeeded in contributing policy policies to, to the stakeholders related to better direct the economic and financial system that can increase income, living standard, welfare, economic in a sustain, uh, uh, environmental care in a sustainable and equitable manner. <clears throat> Next, please. Now we begin to uh, 
explore the previous literature review that support the current research, which is uh, uh, we can see in the screen that the uh, Baka, Lasasna, and Diao 2014, and Sefi and Reds 1 2020 suggest that, that use uh, financial instrument uh, indicator as suku as an instrument of increasing economic growth and as a as a uh, as an instrument for poverty reduction. While Mohildin, Grasa Gasdar 2014, and Alam et al 2000. Fifth, uh, 2015 use indicator domestic credit to the private sector by conventional Islam, conventional Islamic bank and suku in relationship with economic group. While others, Abbasiria 2016, Ali et al, Javits and Sarif 2000 et al, Nasrin and Awar 2015, Sabas et al, and so on and so forth measure the, uh, measure, measure the importance of domestic credit to private sector with carbon emission. Next, please. Uh, now I will use uh, the independent and dependent variable, which is, as you know, in a previous explanation that I use financing by Islamic Bank and Suku uh, as an indicator of Islamic capital market development. Uh, then I will use the uh, headcount ratio and then gross domestic product per capita and then and the last is carbon emission per capita. And this is, there are three hypothesis research, while number one is Islamic financial development had a significant effect on SDGs number one, while number two is Islamic financial development had a significant effect on SDGs number eight, and then hypothesis number three, Islamic financial development had a significant effect on SDGs number 30 that contribute to climate action. And as you've seen on the screen, this is the research equation in this study are as follow. Next, please. Okay, this is the conceptual framework of uh, my research. Next, please. Next, please. Mm -hmm. of... okay. Yeah, now we, uh, we move to the result and contribution of the paper that the study uh, began with the preliminary examination using classical assumption test to check uh, regression linearity, residual normality, non-multicollinearity, non heteroscedasticity and non auto correlation non and non auto correlation after all the classical assumption tests have been conducted the three research equation model fulfill the classical assumption requirement okay uh, based on the table 4.1 statistical result of hypothesis testing we can see that islamic financial development uh, both financing and suku has significant impact on the achievement of sustainable development goal proposed by the United Nations. It is related to reduce poverty, goal number one, goal number eight, and goal and goals number 13. And Islamic financial development in Indonesia has proven to be in line with the objective of SDGs by the United Nations. Okay, we can see in this table that the variable financing and suku have a significant positive effect reducing poverty in Indonesia at 1% significant level. And, there is, and this result is in line with the previous study conducted by Baha, Safi Reswan, Mohildin, and Udin et al. as stated in the previous literature review. And then uh, why this, uh, why this happened, uh, why this result happened, that financing has an impact on poverty reduction by providing capital to small borrowers and small entrepreneurs that struggle to obtain funding due to high capital costs caused by information asymmetry and the failure of market mechanism. In addition, financing provided by Islamic banks is an interest-free type of a financial instrument that use a risk sharing system so that, the so that the arising risk will share with investor and borrowers according to their capacity and effort. So system do not hurt one another as in conventional lending system that prioritizes the interest aspect for profit furthermore. The capital accumulation that they get used to open business to gain profits that can improve their living standard and expand employment opportunities for others. Increase employment opportunities not only affect individual but also have a macroeconomic impact on poverty alleviation, which means it can enhance a country's economic growth. Next, please. The development of suku in the research year has a more promising prospect in the context of poverty reduction when compared to development of financing by Islamic banks in Indonesia. 
Suku begin to be widely used as an alternative to financing debt-based economic and social project in accordance with Sharia because it has an underlying asset. Suku in Indonesia can develop rapidly by utilizing the abundant natural resources available. A reminder that the Indonesia is one of the developing countries that still hardly depend on economic activities from natural resource-based sectors such as agriculture, plantation, livestock, marine energy, and so on and so forth. The existence of suku involving the flow of funds from individual corporation and the government will able to support economic and social projects such as school, hospitals, road, water, electricity, and so on and so forth. Can benefit to the wider community for the welfare of inclusive development in Indonesia. Increasing the welfare of Indonesian people in the economic and financial sector will be in line with the increase of economic growth. This indicates that the result of a significant positive regression coefficient of the effect of financing on gross domestic product per capita. But oppositely, as, a, as, as, as stated in Table 4.1, Suku has no significant effect. Okay. The result of the study are in line and are also in line with the previous studies. Why this is happen? Why Suku does not have a significant contribution? Uh, that this reason might may be that suku market do not contribute to economic growth. This result may be explained by the, the by the fact that suku markets are new and generally small capital market in the Indonesian countries. Moreover, suku markets are not necessarily traded freely in the secondary market that is less able to reach a large, medium, or small investor. So the suku market capitalization in Indonesia do not, does not reach a threshold level level that will enable them to contribute economic growth. However, the achievement of economic growth in a country has an external impact on the environment as a result of the interaction between human and nature. Okay. As, uh, as the external impact of human and nature, uh, environmental degradation has been arrived, which is an important, uh, which, which is as an important issue to date uh, is related to the climate change caused by increasing carbon emission in various parts of the world, including in Indonesia. Uh, now we can see in this table 4.1 that the, uh, we can see that only suku has a significant negative effect on carbon emission at the level of 10%, but oppositely, financing has no significant effect. Okay, the impact of financial development on carbon emission in Indonesia is still negative. It is argued that this country is still at the initial stage of the financial development. At this stage, we will use uh, at this stage uh, both financing and suku will be used for investment capital and consumption. They use a lot of resources on a massive scale to obtain return on investment capital. So the possibility of natural resource exploitation will be led to increase carbon emission. Next, please. Okay, now we begin to conclude the result of the study that can be, uh, it can be concluded that both financing and suku significantly can contribute to the achievement of the three SDGs in Indonesia. Uh, that what, what we have learned from this research is financing provide, uh, what we have learned from this research, uh, financing provided by Islamic banks must begin to pay attention to the, must begin to the, pay attention to the financing targets for the environmentally friendly economic sector. If today's financing currently give to a consumptive activity in the community, Islamic Bank must begin to turn financing into productive activity that support the development of sustainable economic sector. In addition, next please, Suku as one of the instrument of the Islamic capital market can also be used by the government as a source of funding that also support reducing carbon emission in Indonesia. Thank you. That's all for me. And please, uh, Prof. Ahmed. Wassalamualaikum yes. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rani, thank you very much. It's a very good example of how we can use the sustainable development goals in, with the, some empirical work and to see whether how we can contribute to sustainable development goals through different channels, including SCOOC, including uh, different policy measures. Uh, so definitely there are certain, uh, these are preliminary stages. But one of the conclusions probably you might want to make, it is not just about SCOOC, but there are new forms of SCOOC, like green SCOOC. Uh, this overall SCOOC might not be contributing much to SDG, but uh, green SCOOC might be more contributive uh, to SDGs. Definitely these are at the more macro level, but I believe it's a, uh, your paper is a quite a good example that 
uh, at the more practical level, at the empirical level, we can analyze the same issues. We can analyze it empirically, but we can have a, a perspective from a sustainable development goals. Because what the sustainable development goals are bringing to us is not to come up with the totally new ideas, but it provides a perspective to us. And then we analyze the topics from a, that perspective. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you can present this paper like a regular empirical paper of seeing the effects of scoop on uh, CO, CO2 emission and so on. But when it comes to sustainable development, we then we start speaking the same language and then we contribute that way. So that's why I guess it's a very good example. Uh, for sure, there could be more to be done. I was just communicating with your professor. Uh, she should be proud of you. Uh, so it's good to see that and hopefully see more of your contribution into the field. Without further ado, uh, Mrs. Afaf Nasiri, join us. Welcome. We were waiting for you for about an hour. So Thank you. I was, I was also waiting for my turn. <laughs> yes, your turn came. So thank you for joining. You have 12 minutes. If you didn't listen to us before, after 12 minutes, I mute you. So that's why. Please go ahead. Floor is okay. yours. Thank you. Uh, yourself, by the way. Yeah, yes, of course. We know you better. Uh -huh. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. As a continuity of the uh, subject of sustainable uh, development, I will be also tackling it this time from another angle, uh, that of waqf and sustainable development goals. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif Al Amri and Dr. Mustafa Omar Muhammad for their support and for their help uh, to the achievement of um, this uh, presentation and the paper. Uh, for myself, uh, my name is Afaf Nasiri. I am from uh, Morocco. Uh, I am currently a PhD student at uh, Zaim Sabahaddin University. Uh, I used to work as the uh, controller, uh, finance controller, and I got my master's uh, in finance and accounting uh, from Morocco as well. So uh, without uh, further uh, details, let's uh, move to our uh, presentation, which I will be uh, presenting following um, this uh, outline. Uh, after the introduction, I will discuss the research problem and questions. Then uh, my objectives of this research. We will then see the literature review methodology. Uh, then we will move to the um, important part, let's say, of this presentation, that of the framework of WAF goals, dimensions, uh, and practice, uh, in order to compare WAF with uh, the uh, 17 uh, goals of sus the sustainable development. So uh, we all know and we have all seen that WAF has played a very significant role towards the socioeconomic, the moral, the spiritual, and also the environmental developments of Muslim communities since the very beginning uh, of uh, Islam. Actually, WAF has contributed to different fields, uh, either to the building of mosques, educational institutions, libraries, even traveler lodges and healthcare centers. It has also contributed to uh, nurturing the values of caring, of giving, and uh, always bringing up God-fearing uh, communities. Uh, WAKF have created opportunities for uh, employment, for investment, and uh, also uh, we should mention the uh, preservation of the environment through uh, clean agriculture and the encouragement of planting uh, of trees. So we can uh, notice and we will prove later on that all these contributions have uh, quite a real relevance uh, to the sustainable uh, development goals and even goes uh, beyond the sustainable development goals. So um, during our uh, research, we have uh, found few studies on WAKF and uh, SDGs. Most of them have focused on how WAKF uh, can be used to finance the SDG-related um, projects. Uh, some other studies have tried to use the SDGs to measure the performances of WAKF empirically. But the issue here is that they lack so, uh, some sound theoretical uh, framework for such um, measure, measures. Uh, that is why uh, in our study, the aim is to uh, develop a framework of 
work goals and dimensions in both theory and practice uh, in order to examine the extent uh, to which these sustainable development goals conform to uh, the work goals and uh, their uh, dimensions. So I have three uh, objectives uh, I would like to attain. That of examining the extent literature on the goals and dimensions uh, of work in both theory and practice. I would uh, also uh, like to develop a theoretical framework related to the goals and dimensions of work. And of course, analyze uh, based on the framework, uh, the extent to which um, SDGs conform to our goals and dimensions in uh, theory and practice. Uh, so while going through literature review, uh, we noticed that there are some volumes of studies on work and these studies are quite like largely descriptive focusing mainly on concepts, history, roles, and types uh, of uh, the WAF institutions. Similarly, the studies on SDGs have been increasing in volumes, uh, also explaining the concepts, their applications in uh, various uh, jurisdictions, and the measures of these goals empirically. There are, however, few studies that have examined WAF and SDGs, most of them have focused on how WACF can finance SDG-related projects. Some uh, have tried to use SDGs to measure the performance of Zaka, for example. However, uh, these uh, latter group of studies are, were not able to develop a sound framework that takes into consideration the unique goals and dimensions of WACF in both theory and practice. And it is really important uh, to adopt such framework in order to avoid any misrepresentation of the goals of WACF in relation to the SDGs. So I could say that the gap in the literature lies in the absence of sound theoretical framework on the goals and dimensions of WACF that can be used to assess uh, SDGs conformity to the WACF practices. Uh, regarding the methodology, my study has adopted a qualitative method following, uh, the, fo following the approaches below, uh, a review of the literature in order to identify uh, wealth goals and dimensions uh, in theory and practice, uh, using content analysis to develop a theoretical framework related to wealth goals and dimensions, a survey of the literature on wealth and SDGs, and finally, using thematic analysis to examine the extent to which SDGs conform to work goals and dimensions in uh, theory and practice. So let's move to the framework of work goals and dimensions. Here we can see that uh, work has so many goals that uh, tackle different dimensions and uh, sites, uh, from spiritual to moral, social, economic, and environmental. All of them uh, have uh, of course, um, goals in this life, but it is important to mention that wealth goals are uh, goals, uh, they go beyond this life. Their goals uh, are, uh, uh, are aiming at the hereafter, at the eternal goal, uh, which uh, we will see later. Specifically, this first two uh, wealth goals, the spiritual and moral. Here by spiritual, I mean the act of worship of God and uh, the purification of the soul uh, from greed. I would like to emphasize on these two goals because um, these uh, specific goals are unique to the wealth. So while comparing later wealth with sustainable development goals, we will see that these two, uh, we cannot find them among the sustainable development goals because uh, these ones are uh, specifically related to the uh, Islamic religion that always uh, gives us this awareness of the uh, hereafter and always seeking uh, credits with Allah in the hereafter. Uh, regarding the other objectives of uh, wealth goals, uh, social, economic, and environmental, well, it is really obvious that wealth has social um, uh, objectives of development, uh, of the values of sharing and caring. Uh, they have economic objectives of creating job opportunities and investments within societies, and also environmental um, objectives of preserving our environment and preserving um, the lands for us and also for the uh, generations to come. Here I will uh, just uh, 
skip this. This is just I am enumerating the 17 goals of SDGs, which we uh, all uh, know and were previously explained by my colleagues. Again, here in the comparison, uh, that is what I have just said between the um, spiritual and moral goals of uh, WAF. Uh, as I said, there are no related SDGs um, in for these uh, WAF. And here, in order to um, like summarize these two goals, there is this saying of Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, when he said, we always work for this life as if you are living forever. But, look, uh, but work for the hereafter as you, uh, if you are dying uh, tomorrow. Uh, let's see the social goals of Waqf. Here, the social goals of Waqf, we can see that they cover five uh, of the um, SDGs, be it gender equality, reduced inequality, and the others. Uh, we know that Waqf resources provide uh, to all people regardless of gender, race, or even religion. And Waqf is actually a form of redistributive means, uh, measures for income uh, in order to um, reduce inequalities between categories within um, any society. Also for uh, the uh, consumption and uh, production, since uh, Waqf resources are guided by Sharia, then we know that in our religion, uh, there, there should be no waste, no corruption and shared um, prosperity. And uh, also for uh, the um, uh, goal 17, that is of partnerships uh, to achieve the goals. Here, it, this is not only for the social goals of Waqf, but also for the other two, economic and environmental. Waqf institutions uh, also seek uh, different partnership with the government, private sector, NGOs, and many other um, civil societies uh, in order to uh, attain their goals. Moving to the economic goals of Waqf, uh, here again, we can see that they cover uh, so many of the um, SDGs uh, uh, for, for example, uh, the goals of fighting um, poverty and hunger. Uh, well, Waqf um, aims at providing basic needs, be it food or shelter, also uh, fighting hunger, either directly or um, indirectly. Uh, also, for the provision of good health and quality education, Waqf institutions try to do so either for free or for some uh, subsidized uh, costs. Uh, same thing for uh, providing water and sanitation, for uh, affording uh, clean uh, energy, and also for uh, providing decent work and economic growth, as we have mentioned before. Like, by uh, contributing to the economic goals, Waqf institutions um, provide job opportunities and uh, enhance the economic growth. Also, same thing for innovation, since we can see uh, that uh, so many new innovative products have uh, come out, such as Cash Waqf and Socially Responsible Investment Sukuk. And also uh, for sustaining cities and uh, communities, since uh, the objectives of Waqf are eternal or in another term are sustainable. Coming to the uh, last uh, Waqf uh, goals, uh, that is uh, environmental goals, here we can find that for the first two, the climate action and um, the life uh, be below water, here uh, I can say that Waqf institutions still need to enhance awareness and increase activities uh, towards um, this goal. Uh, for the other one, life on land, here Waqf institutions actually contribute to sustaining life on land, not only for human beings, but also for animals, birds, and even for planting uh, trees. After seeing this uh, comparison uh, between the different dimensions of wealth and the goals of SDGs, we can clearly say that wealth institutions share several goals in common with SDGs. Uh, coming to the environmental uh, goals, we can say that uh, these ones uh, need to be enhanced more and more uh, by Waqf in order to be uh, achieved as well. And let's not forget that Waqf goals are unique in terms of spiritual and moral goals, which, uh, as we saw, are not embodied in SDGs. So uh, here, uh, when we see that uh, SDGs are short term, I mean, their uh, due date is by 2030. Uh, on the other hand, Waqf goals are eternal until the hereafter. 
So such a time span has a far-reaching motivation for individuals and societies towards the eternal uh, sustainability. I thank you very much for your attention and for uh, your patience and looking forward to any questions or contributions uh, from your side. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Zafak, thank you very much. We have about eight minutes left for the questions. I would like to thank all the presenters. Uh, they were all very timely, very important topics. But I particularly would like to thank uh, Professor Mansur Afifi. Professor Mansur Afifi, we are the oldest ones in this session. As you see, the young generation is coming. They are all working on sustainable development goals. I would like to particularly congratulate you. You seem to follow the literature well and adapt yourself. So I guess this, this requires certain appreciation. So thank you very much to you. And for the thank young, you I congratulate you also. This is, this is a great work. It's a good start. And inshallah, you will be contributing to the field and you will be remembered for that. So uh, I, we have now seven minutes. Uh, apparently there is no question sent it to me, sent to me through WhatsApp. They told me that we are going to have questions if there is any from the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, apparently there is not right now. So I would like to turn again back to you guys and then I would like to give you the floor just for, for one and a half minutes. Uh, if you want to add anything or if you want to comment on the other's presentation, let's start with Mrs. Ramuta or anyone who would like to uh, take the uh, words first. Anyone is volunteering to comment on the different subjects? Then not, uh, then uh, Mrs. Ramuta, would you like to add something more? Mm, not really, actually. But I appreciate all other um, participants for their contribution and knowledge shed. Actually, not until you part of this kind of um, presentation or watching wherever you are, you wouldn't know that um, Islamic finance or Islamic economies have a lot to contribute, not only in SDGs, as my sister rightly mentioned, SDG is a short term, but Islamic finance, Islamic economics, and all aspects related to Islamic, you know, it's a long term because um, the contribution of it is not only seen in this world, but we assume that it was going to be rewarded in the year after. So I think we've learned a lot from our colleagues, and it's a good presentation that each and everyone here, I think, has contributed. So we appreciate everyone's contribution. And thank you also, Prof for your time, patience, and understanding. Thank you. I think Thank that's you. all what I want to say for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mustafa Helvejolo. Yes, from Konya, Mustafa Bey, what are you saying? Yes. I would like to first thank you. It's really a great honor uh, to make this presentation uh, under your session. Yeah, this is really honoring me. And, uh, I want to thank to all the other uh, contributors, especially the people who are working on the sustainable development. Uh, this is something we have to really focus on. And, uh, but the, the, yeah, in the Western context cannot understand that the actual uh, current financial uh, institutions cannot carry this uh, big uh, responsibility. So we have to, as Islamic economics, uh, per, from the uh, Islamic economics perspective, we have to contribute more. We have to put our hands under this uh, stone and carry this to forward. And uh, we have to also introduce the ethical frame uh, <coughs> on these uh, goals. Uh, inshallah, we will, uh, with your support and uh, your guidance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, achieve this goal. Thank you very much for, for giving me this work. Together, inshallah. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Mansur Afifi. Yes. Thank you, Professor Hassan. I, I would like to um, ask. Uh, 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 Asani, uh, Afaf Nasiri, can would you please explain more detail uh, how Wakaf can contribute to uh, to support the achievements of the SDG goal, especially goals number fourteen and fifteen, as you mentioned in the conclusion. Oh, in, in, in the last presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mrs. Apov, you have two minutes to answer. Thank you. I'm just going uh, quickly to the goal uh, 14 and 15 that are of 
life below water and life on land. Actually, what I have mentioned is that work uh, institutions uh, do not uh, actually for 15 it is actually existing for life on land as I said that WAKF is contributing to uh, life of all uh, living uh, like human beings birds uh, which has existed uh, since before for example for life uh, below water let's see that now like for example with this pollution and with uh, many factories uh, in oceans and in seas we can see that Many of them are polluting the ocean. Many of them are killing our resources in the ocean, be it uh, fish or uh, any other resources. So if we work towards this objective by uh, uh, making uh, people more aware about the preservation of our environment, about the preservation of this uh, wealth that we have and their seas, I believe that this uh, would lead us, this is uh, in, um, uh, this is uh, like for a continuity, like for us to be able to benefit. I'm, I come personally from Morocco. It is a country which has two sides, like the sea and the ocean. But we can see that with this pollution and with the amount of uh, the non-awareness uh, of people about the importance of such resources, in the last years, we have seen a decrease in, uh, in like what we have as um, a wealth, for example, in, in uh, under uh, the life under water. So, it was in this sense that we should make people more aware of whatever sources we have and make them also aware about how to use them in an efficient way not being uh, only thinking about our uh, own um, benefit but also for the generations to come inshallah i hope i answered your question yes thank you zafaf there is yes. one question came before I give the floor to Mrs. Rani, let me ask the question, and then if any one of you, we may give that responsibility to you, Professor. The question is a bit tough, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hawa Bibihan is asking, how do we lead the discourse from Islamic economics perspective instead of creating opportunity for Islamic economics by highlighting what is the gaps in sustainable development goals? Uh, and the Western approach to uh, economics. I guess the question is, can we contribute from more from an Islamic economics perspective and to see some of the drawbacks or some of the deficiencies in sustainable development goals? Not just adopting SDGs as it is, but probably we can improve SDGs, which is depicted by United Nations. Tough questions, Professor Mansur, you have two minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's a very tough question, yeah. because um, I think the uh, Islamic uh, um, teaching has provided uh, views, values, and, and also um, uh, perspective in dealing with such things. For example, if we want to solve the problem number one, like uh, poverty and hunger, yeah, we have instruments. And also we have concepts, concept of uh, contributing, concept of dividing, concept of giving, you know, zakah, we have zakah, we have infarcts, we have sodaka. Yeah. So we can, we can use this concept to, uh, to achieve the goals of poverty eradication. And also, as I mentioned in, in my presentation, even for life below water and life on land, we have concepts. Islam provides the concepts, ideas, norms, uh, values, and perspectives to deal with uh, such a problem. Like also, um, as far as the says that uh, by walk up, we can use walk up as, um, as a, uh, to, we use walk up for financing or for uh, financing the activity of increasing awareness, public awareness, so that people will uh, behave uh, in a proper way, as uh, suitable to support the um, the goals of sustainable development. So if that's enough, Professor Hassan. Thank you, thank you, Professor. It's a great contribution. Uh, oh, let me also, yeah. I, I, if I can add quickly yes, something. 
related to this uh, question. As uh, you have mentioned before we started this session that you said, for example, uh, now some journals still do not recognize the Islamic finance, still do not recognize the tools of Islamic finance. So here, in order to answer this question, uh, I think that the best uh, chance for us and the best way to introduce this Islamic finance in a way that would be accepted without uh, being uh, looked at as a new thing or as a different thing is by adopting some of the approaches like for example of the sustainable development goals but always we take good practices and we adapt to what we have in our islam we adapt to what we have in our religion so uh, we will see this like we have seen it in uh, the crisis financial crisis in 2008 and we will see now with the covid 19 we will see in the future and i think that this is the best uh, opportunity for the islamic finance to show its uniqueness and to show that it can face uh, real problems economic social environmental problems with the use of the uh, western let's say tools of uh, the sustainable development yeah, yeah. I, I i completely agree what you have said so this is a good opportunity but even Having said that, it means that the Islamic economics is on the passive side. There is an agenda set and we are trying to fit ourselves into that agenda. But I guess the question is how to set the agenda. But unfortunately, we are not very good in that. Especially after 2008, I was more hopeful. There was a good attention to Islamic economics, Islamic finance. But uh, there, there, is, there is a need for coordinated action. And I believe that we have a lot to learn from uh, the setting up of the sustainable development goals. They have some preliminary stages. They brought many politicians, many practitioners, regulators together. They first discussed the different aspects because, you know, Millennium Development Goal was there. There was already some discussions, but the Millennium Development Goal didn't raise the same level of attention that the Sustainable Development Goal has raised. But the good thing is that they learned. They made it more inclusive. In the past, in the Millennium Development Code, it was just goals, it was mostly government level, it was more intergovernmental negotiations were going on. But in the setting up the Sustainable Development Goal agenda, they made the initial discussions more inclusive. All business parties, universities, uh, different sectors, the academics, NGOs. they're all involved. One of the lacking thing in our case on setting up the agenda for Islamic economics, unfortunately, we don't do that. Uh, I mean, we have Islamic Development Bank, for example, they have some power. We have G20, we have some Islamic countries, we have COMSEC, we have lots of organizations. But when it comes to setting up the agenda, uh, we are somewhat actually failing uh, to, uh, to set the agenda for the global economy. This is partly related with us because we are saying that Islam is different, Islam is that. We are differentiating ourselves from the beginning and then they, they start treating that, okay, this is a, some sort of a marginal field and we don't involve. So we have to bring out the more universal message of Islam and we have to be able to use the universal language. Otherwise, we will be receptive of the global agenda. So that's a very good question by Hawa Bibi uh, that, uh, I mean, we, we have to be setting sure. the agenda, but for that, there are certain procedures and we seem to be unfortunately lacking behind. Uh, we are not showing that sort of a governance structure, but I believe Islamic Development Bank, COMSEC, uh, Islamic countries, even within G20, by the way, because I mean, there are about right now, Indonesia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, there are three Muslim countries, if not more, and G20, even in those sort of setups, we can bring out the, some of the Islamic perspective uh, in order to be inserted to sustainable development goals, even uh, to, to be active players in setting the global agendas. Uh, but I guess that is, that is our, uh, somewhat our fault. And that's why, inshallah, we have young generation here. We will do our best as academics. And inshallah, all the parties will do their best. But with, so with all my respect, Professor Aysan, would you give me just one sentence word? Sure, sure. Just, just want to uh, draw attention one more time. I think the key here is the institutions, that uh, we, ch we transformed our institutions as the Islamic world, but uh, mm -hmm. we mimicked uh, the Western uh, institutions and we weighted everything from their side, the ideas, the uh, organizations, and even the operational side. 
So it's if we really trust and uh, you know uh, confident about our religion, of course, and then the its teachings and its uh, benefits to the humanity, then we have to uh, now uh, look at our institutions and retransform them to serve these goals better and uh, prove it to the world. And so that it will be an inclusive, it's not of course exclusive that differentiating yourself, but we have to make an inclusive effort and we have to unite also. As you just mentioned, it was very important that we need an, uh, a common uh, agenda within the Islamic countries as, as a start, for instance. Thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. That's why we need this sort of global community of young scholars working and thinking on those issues. Sure. Yes, Mrs. Rani. So yes. you're uh, uh, more on the empirical side. Again, uh, yes. okay. that's a very important dimension that we hold, have to also invest. Yeah. What are your last words before the session? <laughs> Not last, but inshallah, we will hear more of your papers, your presentations. But for this, I mean, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Ahmed Farouk. Uh, this is a great honor to be joined with the uh, uh, great scholar in here, and then sharing any research idea about SDGs and Islamic uh, in in the in this area of Islamic economy and finance. I think that. Islamic economic and finance is uh, is a part of SDGs uh, because it's not only uh, as a as a total as a value of financial economic and financial system, but also it's a total value based system uh, uh, drawn in uh, Makos Charia. So I think maybe uh, for me it's not all and for me and for all maybe uh, not only the three SDGs as mentioned in my paper, but also uh, the 17 SDGs will be, uh, will be, uh, will be a sifting by uh, the Islamic economic and development. That's all Prof, uh, uh, Prof Ahmed Farouk. And thank you for your attendance, okay, their attention, please. Wassalamu okay. alaikum. Okay. Yes, Mrs. Half yeah. of you already answered the question, but any last words before we end? Uh, as you said, uh, we are the young scholars. I hope that we will be able to follow your leads, inshallah, to come with new tools, to come with new uh, answers for the current uh, issues uh, all over the world uh, from our religion and uh, from uh, all this uh, sustainable development, uh, social responsibility, and so on. Uh, I would like to thank you for your um, uh, for uh, your attention, also for uh, all the um, new informations that you added, the new research areas that you pointed out for us, and hopefully we meet in another um, conference, inshallah. Thank you very much. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah, it is good to have such sort of webinars that we have attendees from all over the world. Love yes. the country of Indonesia, from Turkey, from Morocco, <laughs> from Eskişehir, yeah. I guess. Ramatu, you are there, I guess. In yes, please. Yes, yes. yes. From Konya, <laughs> Holy Land. <laughs> so it is good to have you all. But inshallah, this COVID-19 things will be over and we will meet oh, in person. Inshallah. And inshallah, inshallah. we will come out with good papers, good ideas influenced by COVID-19 because this is one of the things also that there is a, there's something happening globally and definitely from a more Islamic perspective we have something to say from a sustainable perspective, from justice perspective, from the teaching of Islam we can contribute to the discussions of COVID-19 and to make the world better one, uh, more livable, more just one. <laughs> Let's pray for that. And again, thank you very much for your great contribution. I would like to thank the organizers uh, also uh, with, uh, before closing. So thank you very much. And thank I'm leaving you, you soon, inshallah. Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum.
Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalatu wassalamu ala rasulina Muhammedin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, dear professors, uh, scholars, students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 12th International Conference on Islamic Economics and uh, Finance with team Sustainable Development uh, for Real Economy. Uh, today we have uh, two keynote speakers. First one is Professor Dr. Mohammed Kadir Hassan. Uh, before he's addressing us, uh, I'd like to introduce him in brief. Professor Dr. Mohammed Kabir Hassan is a professor of finance in the Department of Economics and Finance in the University of New Orleans. Professor Hassan is the winner of the 2016 Islamic Development Bank Prize in the Islamic Banking and Finance. Professor Hassan received his BA in Economics and Mathematics from Rostos Odyssey College, Minnesota, USA, and MA in Economics and PhD in Finance from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, USA, respectively. Professor Hassan is a financial economist with consulting research and teaching experiences in development finance, money, and capital markets. Islamic finance, corporate finance, investments, monetary economics, macroeconomics, Islamic banking and finance, and international trade and finance. Professor Hassan has done consulting work for the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, uh, African Development Bank, Transparency International Bangladesh, Islamic Development Bank, United Nations Development Program, government of Turkey and many uh, private organizations. Professor Hassan has been elected a uh, board member of the Ethics and Governance Committee and Education Board of Accounting and Auditing Organization for the Islamic Financial Institution, AUF. Uh, please, Prof, uh, stage is yours. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan yurajim bismillahi rahman yurajim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and good morning and good evening to the audience. Today I have been listening to the keynote uh, presentation of all the greats and big scholars in Islamic finance over the last five, six days. Uh, there are a few names um, uh, Murad Sijaska, Professor Mohammed Bulut, Sami Soilam, Mehmet Asute, Abbas Mirakhar, Arif Arsoy, Tarikullah Khan, Manzar Kaab. Azmi Umar, and after me, Professor Dr. Mavid al Jarhi coming. Today, I'm going to take a different take. Uh, um, this is a convergence uh, between Islamic finance and ethical finance. So this work uh, is done with a number of scholars from Italy who has an interest in ethical finance, and I have an interest in Islamic finance. So we are combining our efforts into this presentation. So it is segmented in different parts. Uh, one part, the main thrust of the research is an empirical research. So I'm going to get into this thing. But before I do this, I want to start with uh, the ethical finance and Islamic finance, how they are related and how they can converge and can help each other. So if you look at the sustainable responsible impact investing is estimated such to be about 30 US trillion dollar whereas Islamic finance estimated size is about $2 trillion. So Islamic finance is bringing value to the society. It stimulates economic activity, entrepreneurship, while addressing poverty and inequality. It promotes comprehensive human development. It advocates fairness. It promotes social trust, cooperation, and solidarity require balance between individual rights and rights of society and state. Doing good is encouraged, does not subscribe to encroachment on anyone's property rights. 
So Islamic finance should engage in socially responsible activities because of its inherent virtues to assist individuals or societies to enhance their living and environmental conditions. Now, specifically, what are the differences, similarities between these two? Ethical finance starts from the value proposition. It outlined in a stated intent, environmental sustainability is one of the goals. For Islamic finance, stated intent expounded in the Quran and the Sunnah from the principles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the manner environmental sustainability achieved is a clear articulation on environmental consideration on the begin following the Bandutland Report 1987 with embedded ESG in investing, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. For the Islamic finance, do good and prevent harm by treating environment in a fair and just manner. Is moderation, avoiding wastage and excesses. Treat every living human being with mercy, duty of care to protect and keep safe for next generation. And what are the methodologies used? Different treatment processes, ethical finance, focuses on negative screening, ESG integration, shareholder activism. What is in Islamic finance? looks at sector screening, entity screening. Now, how does ethical finance contribute to financial stability the way Islamic finance does? For ethical finance, it has a long-term orientation, avoidance of short-term transactions, avoidance of high-risk speculative activities, governance process and ESG framework, high degree of disclosure and transparency, and emphasis on ethics, culture, and values. Whereas Islamic finance, the elements of Islamic finance that contribute to financial stability, the requirement that financial transactions be supported by real economic activity, profit and loss sharing, hence built-in risk management, robust governance process, both Sharia and corporate governance, embedded transparency, and avoiding speculative or illegal activities. So, there are commonalities between these two strands, Islamic finance and ethical finance, long-term orientation and sustainability. Both are inclusive, both are, have ethical values, economic well-being, and finally, preserving interests of the next generation. But there is a difference in focus. Ethical finance, it gives priority to environment, adding value to society, whereas Islamic finance is strongly by its very definition, anchored to real economy, strong built-in elements of financial stability. Now, there is some benefit, a study done by Refinitiv shows that ethical finance can significantly improve environmental, social governance performance. ESG scores is 6% higher for governance, Sharia compliant financial companies, whereas it's 10% higher for Sharia compliant non-financial companies, which basically tells there is something convergent Sharia and ESG screening. Sharia and ESG screening show some correlation. Combining these two can improve overall risk adjusted returns, greater focus on ESG specific screening on top of Sharia screening would minimize risk from such exposure. So the both Sharia compliance screening and ESG screening create portfolios with similar characteristics. So combining both screens can add significant new information. And Islamic banks face indirect environmental risk based on types of economic activities they finance. And they can factor in environmental and social risk into its charges to reduce risk exposure. And also it can influence clients to adopt risk mitigation techniques. So, what are the methods they both follow? SRI and ESG is exclusionary screening, best in class selection, active ownership, thematic investing, in impact investing, and ESG integration. Now, impact investing, according to the Global Impact Network, the practice of impact investing has four core characteristics. Investors intend to have a social or environmental impact they use evidence and data to derive investment design. Investors manage themselves towards the intended impact through measures such as establishing feedback loops and communication of performance. 
and investors with credible impact investing practices use shared industry terms, conventions, and indicators. So exclusionary screening is the most common ESG method by Islamic finance. As I said before, Islamic finance uses screening to avoid financing business built on riba, excessive gorar, alcohol, adult entertainment, gambling. In Islamic equity investing, further exclusion screening is applied based on the proportion of impossible income and the leverage of the companies. And companies with impermissible income of more than 5% of total income or with a debt level more than 33% of book value or market capitalization are excluded. And these exclusion measures differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And it also, the exclusion screening in Islamic finance may vary depending on how the ratios are defined and calculated. Tobacco provides an interesting case in Islamic exclusionary screening. Tobacco consumption is not directly associated with a prohibition in primary source of Islam. However, modern Islamic finance prohibits businesses associated with it because smoking is injurious to health. So what are the similarities between these two? Both approaches have a strong ethics foundation. Commonalities include a concern for human rights and environment, a focus on long-term sustainability and success, and avoidance of aggressive leverage. A research report on Islamic finance and EHG consideration states that a direct correlation between Sharia compliance and ESG scores. Now, there are different guidelines and standard setters. You have the United Nations Global Impact, Compact, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, Global Sustainable Investment Alliance, principle for responsible investment. And this body's publication influence practices in both SRI investing and Islamic finance. And the development of Islamic finance has also benefited from standard setting bodies such as AOFI. AOFI has a standard on corporate social responsibility known as corporate social responsibility conduct and disclosure for Islamic financial institution. And this standard lays out mandatory and voluntary conduct and serves as a common reference point in Islamic finance. So, but however, there are differences of economic thought. Whereas, sorry, SRI investing focuses more on financial decision rather than the wider economy, whereas Islamic finance is born out of Islamic economic thought. It intends to criticize the free market versions of capitalism and using an Islamic worldview, it seeks to identify ways and means to arrive at a more just economic order, one with less inequality and more stability than the present one. So there is an ethical bridge both on the term that you both wants to avoid harm and do good. And this bridge is built on shared common concern about society and the environment, as well as historical connection. Historically, similarities between Islamic investing and SRI investing are most visible with respect to traditional faith-based socially responsible investing in the United States that use similar exclusion screening on similar industries. There are modern examples of financial services providers who have been able to create offerings that both meet Islamic prohibitions and consider ESG considerations. For example, Amana mutual funds in the United States where I live seek companies that demonstrate both Islamic and sustainable characteristics. The funds literature defines sustainable insurers as those that are established consistently profitable financially strong and following robust ESG policies. Setco, on the other hand, capital, one of the largest asset managers in Saudi Arabia, combines traditional Islamic screening with modern ESG considerations. It describes this as its prudent ethical approach and believes that it leads to financial outperformance. And some examples, Sukuk meet advanced ESG criteria in 2017, a green Sukuk was issued in Malaysia raising US $59 million to finance a solar power plant. And the Sukuk was issued under Malaysia SRI Sukuk framework and endorsed by the Sharia Advisory Council of the Securities Commission in Malaysia. Now the main drivers of originatory growth, the main drivers of the signatory growth in OIC countries 
are the strong alignment of social objectives in responsible investment and Islamic finance and the additional financial value of integrating environmental, social and governance factors into investment processes which can be combined with Sharia screening. Bank Nijwa, a fast growing Islamic bank in Oman, has distinguished itself by embedding social and economic environment in its financing and by enabling staff to participate in charitable activities. So this example illustrates that providers of financial services can create offerings that will qualify as both Islamic and SRI investing. So what are the convergence between these two? Doing more on ESG issues is helpful to Islamic finance in addressing the criticism leveled against it for putting legal technicalities of Islamic commercial jurisprudence over economic and moral substance. And Islamic finance has been learning and will continue to learn from developments in SRA investing will adopt accordingly. The reverse, that is the SRA investing adopting Islamic finance conservatism is less likely to happen because the financial conservatism built into Islamic finance prohibitions does not feature prominently among the priorities of SRI investing customers and providers in its core markets. That said, the better the Islamic finance becomes at managing ESG issues, the more likely it is to be accepted as part of SRI investing. Now coming back to the empirical exercise that we have done for this presentation, the growing interest Islamic finance, the interest in Islamic corporate finance and CSR, the concept of CSR is theoretically embedded in Islam, in Islam and CRR similarities as I explained with ethical investment, but also differences in practices as I explained before. No study to date investigate the interaction between CSR and Sharia screenings, and benefits of ESG screenings could be larger for Sharia compliant firms. So what are the research question in this empirical piece of my presentation? Assessing whether Sharia compliance enhances the risk mitigating effect of ESG engagement on market risk of non-financial firm, distinguishing systematic and idiosyncratic risk, identifying ESG sub-pillars and categorized provide greater benefits to Sharia compliant firms. So there is a snapshot of existing empirical literature connecting CSR and size of our literature finds a negative relationship between CSR and farm risk, cost of debt, cost of equity, cost of capital, dividend policy. And Islamic corp finance literature is still in infancy. Sharia, certification effect of Sharia compliance in lowering cost of capital. I have a piece with Dr. Halim in affecting stock market valuation of bond offerings, Godlowski, and influencing credit ratings, Said Azmok and his co-authors. And there is also Islamic level effect on Sharia compliance firms. I have another piece, style of managers in taking financial decisions. Now, with this empirical exercise, we want to contribute to the ex extending the literature on Islamic corporate finance and CRSA by studying the combined effect of Sharia and ESG screen screenings, as I explained before, and the ability of Sharia compliant firms to benefit from a stronger risk mitigating effect at higher levels of ESG engagement about ESG, the effects of the sub pillars on Islamic firms market risk and theoretical contribution and agency stakeholder and portfolio theories applied to Islamic firms. Now, there are similarities and difference I said in the previous slide, so I will skip these two things. So what are the theoretical framework and hypothesis they're trying to develop? Both the portfolio and agency theories predict a negative outcome from CSR in Islamic screenings, while stakeholder theory attributes to engagement in such activities a positive result. And CSR additional non-financial screenings increase searching and monitoring costs or lower diversification opportunities leading to lower returns or higher volatility and agency issues in forms to high management behavior. But stakeholder theory, on the other hand, screenings are likely to have a positive impact since they allow the selection of financially stronger, more stable, more profitable companies. 
Then do, on the basis of this theory, we develop a series of hypotheses, our first hypothesis, ESG scores, irrespective of compliance to Sharia principle, are negatively associated to market risk, both as a composite score and when broken down in sub-pillars or categories. In Islamic firms, screenings with negative effect on performance and positive on risk due to searching a monetary cost, more concentrated, on the other hand, more stable and financially stronger firms and positive stakeholder effects. Then we have hypothesis two, Sharia compliance, irrespective of the level of ESG score is positively associated with market risk of firms. And Cho in 2012 said, finding that membership in an ethical index is far more affected by what firms say rather than what they do. Sharia compliant firms engaged in ESG practices should improve their liquidity, exclude high leverage or excessive uncertainty or include screening that mitigate market risk. So high levels of ESG scores are associated with stronger risk mitigating effect in Sharia compliant firms. So actually we have done a huge empirical research collecting data on 4,624 known financial firms with an ESG score. Uh, out of this 1970 Sharia compliant form, 2707 are not, and it is coming from Thomson Reuters Definitive Database, period 2002-18. Extensive and global data set that covers the following continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, and Oceania. So this is our empirical model, full OLS regression with time, industry, region fixed effects, and market risk. We have standard deviation of monthly stock returns of the previous year, market model for idiosyncratic and systematic risk, and variable interest is ESG score and the dummy Sharia with their interaction. So we do have a lot of controls in, uh, in order to take care of endogeneity and robustness. So I want to uh, just say one, to address endogeneity in the form of reverse causality, you have instrumental variable two stage least square. To further address endogeneity between CSR and farm risk, we use 2008 and 2009 financial crisis as an unexpected exogenous event to shock the system in order to address the endogeneity issue. We have a triple different interaction term which tells our story. Subsample focus in North Africa, EU, and Asia. We have a propensity score matching comparing equity risk of Sharia compliant and conventional farms. And also we have other subsample for ESG score levels, lower, high levels, farm size, larger and smaller, whether they differ between these parameters, stage of development of the reference country, emerging versus developed country. So what are our main results? The ESG scores are able, regardless of Sharia compliance, to reduce market risk. And this risk mitigating effect occurs for both the idiosyncratic risk and systematic risk despite being stronger for the latter. Sharia compliance, regardless of the level of the firm's ESG score, increases all measures of firm risk, especially the system the component, because of the reduced investment opportunity set. However, the interaction term shows that for high levels of ESG score or sub-pillars, risk mitigating effect on Sharia compliant firms is stronger than for conventional firms, resulting in lower levels of market risk. Integrating ESG practices in Sharia compliant farms erases the positive association with farms undiversifiable risk and ESG and Sharia screening together provide an overall risk reducing effect, but only the former is associated in a statistically significant sense with systematic component. When these are combined, we obtain a net risk mitigating effect arising from both the total and idiosyncratic risk. So this is an empirical and our paper has a series of tables that we um, demonstrate our results, the total risk, idiosyncratic risk, systematic risk. If you just simply look at ESG in Sharia, you see a negative impact. Um, and if you look uh, uh, ESG by itself, it has a negative impact. So when you combine Sharia with ESG, it does have a negative risk reduction, both in total risk and idiosyncratic risk sense. So in, we do also the sub-pillar, sub-pillar in the interaction environmental social are highly correlated with the risk reduction for Sharia compliant firms. 
Conversely, we do not detect any statistically significant association with interaction Sharia compliance and governance. So governance is still poor. The main drivers of the risk mitigating role of ESG scores, regardless of farm being Sharia compliant or not, are resource use and emission for environment, workforce and product responsibility for society and management and CSR strategy for governance. We do a number of robustness check and this robustness check also shows a negative association between risk and ESG scores and holds across subsamples, mainly for larger firms and for developed countries. So we contribute to the literature by linking the CSR and Islamic corporate finance research streams. We document for the first time using a huge amount of data the role played by Sharia compliance regarding the market risk of non-financial firms and Sharia compliant firms receive on average higher ESG total and individual scores and mitigating effect of ESG score in reducing market risk for all firms. So we conclude when Sharia compliance is considered regardless of ESG score, the prevailing effect is the traditional portfolio theory prediction of an increase in market risk, possibly confirming concern about lower diversification, higher screening and monitoring costs and stronger agency issues. However, as ESG scores increase, the risk mitigating effect is stronger for Sharia compliant firms than for conventional ones, leading to lower final level of market risk for firms highly committed to CSR. And attractiveness of Sharia compliant entities that are highly engaged in CSR in terms of response to market. So the overall conclusion is that in addition to doing negative screening for Islamic Sharia compliant funds, they also have to do positive screening by bringing the components of ESG into its um, investing decision. Now, I just want to switch a little bit. So why you are doing Islamic finance, of course, is rooted in divine law the prohibition of hard court transaction. We talk about economic justice, economic justice for all humanity, circulation of wealth, interest concentrates wealth, commoditization. We try to re relate to this real assets, risk sharing, and does not transfer risk to the borrower. And by doing this, when you compare, lending is a debt-based economy and investing in ethical equity-based economy it's a win-lose framework. It's a zero-sum game in a lending framework, but it's a win-win framework is in investing in equity-based ethical framework. In lending, it creates debt. In investing framework, in real assets. In lending, you transfer risk, but in et ethical equity investing, your risk is shared. In lending, you unfair gains for profit and losses. In ethical, just and fair profits and loss sharing, and in lending, rich gets richer, poor gets poorer. And in ethical equity-based investing, such as Islamic finance promotes justice and equity. Now, it is not always so. Islamic finance was initially launched to avoid interest-bearing system, to promote equity-based financing, to share profit and loss among various stakeholders, to avoid a priority fixed return so that business return can be attached to risk to place productivity at the center of financing. However, right now, where it is going? The practice of Islamic banking industry did not follow this idealist theory of the pioneers, our forefathers. The system has relied heavily on undesirable contracts. There has been a shift in ideology connecting fixed return to PLS-based system. Some of these ideological shifts were ruled out by early advocates of Islamic finance a number of theoretical compromises were made by third generation of Islamic finance experts and Sharia scholars. This approach, of course, could not result in the alternative of the conventional system, rather leads to integration of Islamic finance within the conventional. So the idealist who started this view PLS and non-interest very best banking, permissibility some undesired debt like instruments, and the social welfare over profit maximization. Then we drifted to debt-like instrument, combining several contracts into one, financial engineering, apologetic attitude for this drift. And then we came second best, fixed return, but to PLS, financial engineering, to cater to customer needs. 
but customer satisfaction over social welfare. So where does the future go? Richard Thomas, chief executive of British Islamic Lander Gatehouse Bank, said the industry is in danger of dying in its cradle because it has taken poison in its food from conventional capital markets. Abbas Miracle in 2000 said, if Islamic banking continues on its selected path of developing reverse engineered Islamic instruments, it will become as vulnerable to cycles and shocks as conventional system. Gaul gives a detailed description of how different sukuk went into crisis, how the Guba crisis impacted Islamic finance. Hassan and Reddy showed the recent financial crisis did hit the Islamic banking industry. So we made the choice. The recent scholar, Sharia permissivity rests upon procedures, not outcomes. The procedure compliance largely explains why Islamic bank was stuck in form, ignoring substance. Versus the idealist, Sharia was revealed by God to protect some key objectives called objectives of Sharia, Makasid al-Sharia, and looking for process compliance such that the negate those underlying objectives is uncalled for by Sharia, and consequently, the practitioner now, because Islamic banking has to compete with conventional one in a mixed system, it is necessary for Islamic banks to efficient and attractive products, else Islamic banks would fail as most of the bank customers look for procedure equivalence. So we really need to relook into few areas, redesigning the banking objectives in line with social needs and makasid of Sharia, promoting small entrepreneurship, connecting Islamic banks to Islamic social activities, regulatory sufficiency, harmonization of policies and practice across border, and awareness and education. So there are four challenges right now, as I see, that is facing the Islamic finance industry globally. We have the communication gap. It's still many people question us whether how Islamic are we Islamic? Are we really peddling religion? to make profit. So misconception, misunderstanding, misplaced notions of Islamic finance must be removed through awareness and advocacy program. We have a trust gap. Social business and impact investing should be emphasized to remove tension among stakeholders of the Islamic finance industry. We have an innovation gap. The balance between macro and micro makashi should be maintained, the so-called form versus substance debate. And finally, you have the talent gap. That's where IZU and the all is, um, different universities and can play a very critical role. A new brand of scholars who are well-versed in Islamic jurisprudence and secular financing techniques and mechanism must be nurtured. Having said that, we are seeing just a few words about the research because I'm in academia. Uh, uh, I do research constantly. so. The question is, what is the definition of Islamic finance? It is a social science that integrates human understanding of divine sources of knowledge into the study of economic problem. So Islamic economics is a social science. It is not a theology. Sometimes we combine this together and make it blurred. It does not have a mandatory link with Islamic economy. It does not necessarily require Islamic economy to test its hypothesis and theories. It focuses on human understanding on divine text. Having said this, we are afraid to take, you know, the way we do empirical research, we collect data, we make hypotheses, because sometimes we are afraid Islamic economic has to come out of the fear of trespassing and divine order by testing and verification methods or social sciences. So when you do this, we are not really questioning the will of God. The whatever has been propounded in Islam, like riba, leads to inequality. We can collect data and we can prove it through our empirical research and those techniques should be taught uh, in the universities so that the, we can bring the, from the Makassid of Sharia how it really helps us practically. Human economic problem, scar means and multiple ends. Islamic economics looks for the solution for the economic problem of man that arises from scarcity of means and multiplicity of ends. It is a positive science. Its findings can be used by policymakers, as in the case of conventional economics. So, whereas in conventional um, economics, greed and competition is the norm, but in Islamic economics, it's a generosity and cooperation is the norm. 
Now there has been tons of research and studies and PhD dissertation I do supervise um, in the United States and all over the world. So there has been a lot of growth going on. Now Islamic economics and finance studies had on the peripheral journals and publication and publication outlets. We have a dart of journals that are reported exclusively to the Islamic banking and finance and Islamic economics. Yes, the new journals are coming up. They are not really have done or reached to the level of acceptance to the, to the greater Muslim academic world and to the least and to the Western world as well. Now, a couple of mainstream journals accept special issues. So in order to integrate with the mainstream final journal, they ask for special issues, they ask for a big amount of money and these special issues are controlled by those colleagues who want to promote their own clientage. As publication in mainstream journals remain an issue, while peripheral journal publication was would not be recognized. So we should try to develop sophistication to overcome the prejudice in the mainstream journals by communicating with them. Now there is increased number of conference and workshop. Well, this 12 uh, conference is an example. Increased number of research centers, increased number of IE degree programs, increased number of research students, improved research quality and increased number of publications. But there is a lack of core Islamic economics of finite journals and more publication in non-Islamic economic finite journals and limited idea of journals that are interested in the field of Islamic finance. Conceptual papers are not attractive from mainstream journals. Limitation of single country studies. We have very limited data. Scope of the journal and interest editors and associate editors. There could be potential bias and there is editor, publisher, and author. So how blind the referee should be. In one of my recent research, I found there are 203 internet-based online journals. And few of them are ISI ranked, and most of them are unrated, fraudulent, or unknown. And they require a significant publication fee. It's a business for many of them. So there is a growing trend, reasonably so, to discourage publishing in these paid journals. But noted journals, on the other hand, require submission fee as a referring requirement and will not even put the paper in the review until and unless the submission fee is paid and which could run from US $100 to $750 per submission. Many such journal require submission fee in each round of review process and the paper can be just rejected even without sending to the reviewer. So I'm coming to the final thoughts. So Islamic economics finance scholars advocate a stronger focus on hermeneutical research as it applies to the field and studying the actual economic behavior of Muslims to move forward in developing the field. Would this be an issue in getting into mainstream journals because of the ideological differences? Considering the trends in Islamic economics final research, both from applied and theoretical perspectives, including thesis, dissertation, is an Islamic economic final disadvantage of a multidisciplinary nature embracing economics, law, and religion? Should Islamic economic finance look at the mainstream academics as benchmark for academic excellence? Or in other words, does it really need to be recognized by the mainstream to be considered as an established scientific discipline? So I see a number of researchers and editor of a journal, but these are the areas I see very few. So I would advise my new friends, young scholars to, to concentrate on this area of Islamic monetary economics. Dr. Mavid al Jarvi is one of the pioneers. You probably hear something from him. There is lack of theoretical model building, the Islamic political moral economy, Islamic social economy, Islamic, Islamic circular economy. So these are the areas the students of Islamic finance uh, should really focus on those who are doing PhD and those who are junior scholar and also the senior scholars, they put their uh, resources into doing more work in these areas where I see very little work has been done. Now, we want to publish because we're in the academia, publish or perish, but getting published preferably in a prestigious journal is also a product of luck. Hitting an interesting and timely topic and getting an impartial and interested referee who's willing to, willing to spend the time necessary to help get your paper into publishable form. Always publish with a purpose. Good luck. And I want to acknowledge the writings of various authors over the years from which 
We have benefited immensely and whose ideas we mingle with ours in this presentation. And with this, I want to conclude. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Prof. Dr. Muhammad Kabir Hassan for such valuable contribution. Thank you. Thank you.
الحجام الحجام يا مؤاد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Good afternoon for uh, someone good morning maybe someone good evening uh, Dear professor, dear uh, scholars, students, uh, and audience, uh, today uh, is the last day of the event, and uh, now we have the last uh, keynote speaker, uh, Prof. Dr. Mavit Al Jarhi. Before he's addressing uh, us, I want to introduce him, uh, Prof. Dr. Mavit Al Jarhi. Uh, Prof. Mavit Al Jarhi is a professor of economics and finance, as well as coordinator of International Center of Islamic Economics and Finance at Social Science University of Ankara. He has previously served as C in CF Malaysia and Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar, as a senior faculty member. He earned his PhD from University of South California, US, in 1975. Since then, he has worked at several academic and professional positions. He was a director of economic and policy planning at Islamic Development Bank between years 1976 and 1978 and was a uh, director general of IRTI from 1996 to 2003. He has won uh, several awards, including IDB Prize in Islamic Economics, Banking and Finance. Uh, Mabit does research in macroeconomics, uh, monetary economics, and uh, financial economics from an Islamic perspective. Now he will address us. Please, Prof. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alladhi yarfa'u alladhina amanu wa alladhina utu al-ilma darajat wa yaj'alu al-taqwa sabilan lima'rifati ma fi al-kawni min ayat wa salatu wa salamu ala mu'allimina wa qudwatina wa uswatina alladhi istaada billahi min ilmin la yanfa'a ومن قلب لا يخشع وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم على الصراط المستقيم والنهج القويم رواد العلوم النافعة والعقول البارعة Distinguished guests and learned audience السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, We are most grateful for this episode of the highly distinguished conference thanks to the distinguished organizers and to the ha hardworking staff that executed the conference details with energetic clockwork. I'd like to share with you some ideas about what to teach in analytical Islamic economics to the forthcoming third generation of Islamic economists, giving some examples and propose a new curriculum content. Admittedly, our march on this road has been hesitant for many years after the first international conference. Most of our pioneers who started the discipline before the conference were not economists. The economists who joined later were trained in neoclassical economics, albeit with some sympathy to Keynes. Western economics in general had a theory of the rate of interest based on liquidity preference or loanable funds. It insisted on trade-offs between equity and efficiency. Only at times of crisis, fiscal policies became counter-cyclically expansionary. Institutions like Zakaa and Awqaf were absent. 
this has been a clear sign that Islamic economics can borrow little from the conventional economic uh, system, except for the general approach. We stuck to the textual methodology inherited from fiqh and adopted by our pioneers as we groped to find our analytical approach. Most of our writings have been bugged down on questions of methodology for the last 50 years. We should have crossed this stage after a few years, but the various, but the vicious cycle continues. When we speak about an Islamic economic system, we sound like describing a dream whose details are getting opaquer over time. The few serious attempts to describe an Islamic economic system have been generally ignored. Western trained Islamic economists have just started to roll up their sleeves to confront these challenges. Meanwhile, students of Islamic economics started working for academic degrees offered mostly by departments of Islamic studies in many countries. Rarely can we find or can we see that some departments of economics offering similar, similar programs. That strongly indicated the little awareness of the subtleties of Islamic economics by our academicians and policy makers. Such an environment, which is hardly suited to the establishment of an economic of an Islamic economic system would call for serious thinking. <coughs> While many of us were involved in following the textual approach, fewer others have opted to building up the discipline by analytical economics. Such efforts have not been spent for just meeting the intellectual challenge, but rather to prepare the third generation of Islamic economists who can use the language of economics to carry out a dialogue with Western educated economists and policy makers in our countries as well as with Western economists abroad. The difficulties encountered by this endeavor is that some Islamic economists, even those educated in, the, in Western schools, have developed a spirit of total rejection of conventional economics to the extent that they wanted to look to they wanted to lock their talent into textual writing and to stay out of economics analysis they became a close clone of sharia rather than economic scholars some centers of learning in the west created chairs in islamic economics occupied by intel by Orientalists who may, whose main approach has been to criticize Islam through the behavior and current status of Muslims. This served to create serious doubts in our students' minds. Surprisingly, such centers have been generously financed by some Muslim countries. Uh, of course, uh, the example in my mind about this is the University of Southern California and Timur Quran, who wrote so much against Islamic economics. And he himself was not an economist, and most of what he was written, what he has written, did not really deserve to be answered. But it fooled many people. Such a situation provides both challenges and opportunities. I intend to present to you some ideas on how to confront the former, that's the challenges and benefit uh, from the opportunities. Hopefully we can start a dialogue about an effective plan for the education in Islamic economics. 
at first we have to meet head head on our most uh, our utmost challenge to convince economists of the necessity to reform neoclassical economics it has been difficult to construct some islamic economic theory using supply and demand analysis when this analysis is basically faulty here we may face a question what's wrong with neoclassical economics we can record three types of objections first the neoclassical methodology insists upon unboundedly rational homo economicus who has a calculative power that exceeded by far the fastest supercomputer that ever existed and would probably exist within few days few decades with an exacting preference ordering for all the commodities that could ever exist it can compare all combinations of that enormous number of commodities and can decide which ones are preferred to others with straightforward consistency it seeks to maximize wealth utility and profits in other words the superhuman is also extremely materialistic we object to the hasty and imprecise way of aggregation done by neoclassical theory from the individual to the market and then to the whole economy the horizontal summation of individual demand curves into a market demand curve requires the smd or the sonnenkaim mantel de bro conditions which even when fulfilled would render the aggregation trivial the new classical belief in strong rationalism i'm sorry strong reductionism is associated with an argument for the micro foundations of macroeconomics <clears throat> the new classics are still unaware that poincare the french physicist in 19 in 1899 has discredited strong reductionism by showing that it was impossible to predict the behavior of a solar system with more than one planet yet to them the consumption function for example would be a simple summation of individual demands for consumption goods their typically hurried aggregation fills the received doctrine with falsehoods making it impossible to use as a basis for useful and realistic analysis and this is the, the, the dilemma that face that we face as islamic economists another example of new classical folly is their implicit aggregation related to the theory of the rate of interest and uh, allow me to give you more details in this regard because you know the rate of interest is something that's prohibited by sharia and we want to see show that the theory of the rate of interest is not worthy of any scientific value the received doctrine starts with the universally accepted concept of time preference that causes a premium of present over future commodities this idea of course goes back to bomb bomb baverk in uh, the austrian economist justifying a higher price for deferred the than for spot payments this is simply a reflection of the urgency of consuming a commodity now rather than later the received doctrine jumps directly to a time preference in money which is reflected to an equilibrium interest rate which is reflected as an equilibrium interest rate either through the liquidity preference or the loanable funds theory this this is the theory that the islamic uh, 
this is the theory that Islamic economists should have disproved from the very beginning. The jump from the commodity time preference to the money interest rate has never been justified, except in a way similar to the uh, Solon Kaim mantle, the bro condition, which renders trivial aggregation. To show the force ahead of the, of the theory of interest, we let us start with few axioms. First, the first axiom, people are mortal with unpredictable lifespans, making present consumption more certain than future consumption. Second, every individual has a different rate of time preference for each commodity. Third, such rates would change with income and relative prices. And fourth, the, rela the rate of time preference for any commodity is different for different individuals. The new classics starting with Irving Fisher would have us believe that the rate of interest is some weighted average of the rates of time preferences summed up for all commodities. Oh, for all commodities and all individuals. We can only guess that the weights here would be either prices or quantities consumed. That's where the new classical folly lies. There is no relationship between the time preference of the commodity and its price. Brit, for example, for lower income groups commands a very high rate of time preference or high urgency, but has a very low price. Driving a Rolls Royce for an hour in contracts would have a much lower rate of time preference, but with a much higher price. Uh, remember that we can consider monetary balances as equal to the value of traded commodities as in the quantity theory equation. But prices in this equation have no relationship with the rates of time preference of their corresponding commodities. In other words, the concept of commodity time preference cannot be projected into an equilibrium rate of interest for money. <clears throat> the only exception is the remote case of people having the same intertemporal preferences for each commodity, which do not change with income, so that aggregation would be acceptable, but would also be equally trivial. Therefore, the set of rates of time preference cannot be mapped into one interest rate for money. We have therefore demolished the neoclassical as well as the Keynesian theory of interest. And this is something that we Islamic economics must present because it's a serious case for the pre prohibition of the interest rate. The observed rate of interest is merely an administered price for money imposed on by the monetary authority for the, or the banking uh, system as a whole. Surprisingly, this administered price is the anchor of monetary policy everywhere, even in Islamic countries. It is a simple consequence of, a, of money being issued and allocated based on lending. Should we switch to a system in which money is issued and allocated based on investment, as it should be in an Islamic economic system, the system would have a rate of return on equity-based financial assets, that's market determined. Time preference would be reflected in markups, rentals charged, attached to the sale, and Ijara finance. So besides, neoclassical economics often commits analytical errors. A case in the, is the concept of perfect competition defined through a perception of an atomistic market where the quantities brought 
of an individual by an individual household as well as the quantity offered for sale by firm on the supply side is infinitesimally small. Neither consumer nor producers can, neither consumers nor producers can influence the price. Everyone is a price taker. That's the way they define perfect competition. Oh, Al Khwarizmi, in his grave, the famous mathematician, would react in horror to the neoclassical sleight of hand that equates the zero with the, an infinitesimally small amount. This is just bad mathematics. If quantities demanded by households and quantities supplied by firms are not zeros, but infinitesimally small, then each would have some influence on price. Price taking would therefore become a myth. The same fallacy is conspicuous when the new classics claim that profit would be maximized when each firm equates price to marginal cost. So this must, wa this must warn us about the type of mathematics used by new classical economists. One must become suspicious of the way math is taught by economists and not mathematicians. Our third generation deserve to have a correct understanding of mathematical concepts and avoid haphazard conceptualizations. Perhaps the worst fault of conventional economics is, the insistent, is its insistence on stable equilibrium. Market capitalism has witnessed repeated crises during the last 150 years. Islamic analytical economics must adopt an approach based on this equilibrium, leaving behind the perfect neoclassical model. Remember the law of diminishing returns, one of the sources of pride for neoclassical economics. It is no law at all. The armchair thinking of econo economists assumes that factories or production units are designed with no excess capacity. This is something that engineers would vehemently deny. When factories are designed, they include significant portion of excessive capacity. Therefore, economists must admit that diminishing returns are neither theoretically nor empirically correct. We can go on and on detailing our strong objections to the received doctrine. The third generation of Islamic economists should be spared going through classes with this material. In particular, our Islamic economics curriculum must contain at least one course on the critique of conventional economics that surveys the ideas of John Robinson, Srafa, Keynes, Keen, and many others. Besides, we need to formulate the history, we need to reformulate the history of economic thought to place Al Shaibani who lived uh, in the uh, 8th century as the father of economics and Ibn Khaldun uh, who lived in the 14th century as the father of analytical economics. We cannot remain indifferent while Western, Westerners crown some 18th century economists in their place. We also need to rewrite the theories of consumers and producer behavior using price searching and relying on this equilibrium analysis. Transactions prohibited by Sharia can be grouped into, can, group, can be grouped under the nomenclature of nominal transactions. They have seriously negative effects on the speeds of adjustment and market mechanisms in contrast to the real transactions that are allowed by Sharia. In this manner, we can provide an economic rationale for every prohibition or permission found in Islamic economics. 
we should have no worries that we may be unable to rationalize. Ibn Rushd had, had proposed a long time ago that there could be no contradiction between science and religion. The fear of such contradiction had made Westerners separate their myth-based religion from the state. We have every reason to keep our intellectually consistent religion and our state inseparable. My textbook is the economic analysis and Islamic perspective is being composed along these, along with these ideas. The first volume is freely available online. The second volume is coming out slowly due to the painful process of writing new material. It will also be made freely accessible. I wish to make it as part of a graduate program in Islamic economics. The program would be open to students regardless of their undergraduate specialization, provided they satisfy prerequisites in math, physics, statistics, and software programming. Of course, math here being taught by mathematicians. It would contain courses on the critique of neoclassical economics, Islamic finance, the economics of Islamic finance, history of economic thought, both conventional and Islamic, mathematical tools would be taught by economists with an attempt to rewrite the theorems of Samuelson and De Brou in proper mathematics. Econometrics would be taught by mathematical statisticians this program would hopefully produce Islamic econo economists with impeccable abilities who can have a lively dialogue with both Western economists and our policy makers. No doubt the message of Islamic economics is being carried out everywhere, yet it is time to evaluate the efforts in this field for their recalibration. We must set our ideas on the coming generation, its preparation should be our priority. We need some urgent and bold steps. First, let us move the Islamic economics programs to departments of Islamic economics. Second, let us agree on a viable graduate program paralleled by a similar program in Islamic finance. Third, we must set our goal as to produce bearers of graduate degrees who can readily work in business enterprises, government institutions, and in policy making. Their minds must be free from follies of, of the received from the follies of the received doctrine. They must aim at reforming both economics and the economic system. That's my message today, thanking again the organizers, as well as the young men and women who strive to execute the conference with utmost precision. Uh, thank you for your patience. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Prof. Al Jahi, for your important contribution. Thank you, sir.
Our world today is full of opportunity, but it's also full of challenges, both to business and to investment. For countries to develop their economies, achieve their sustainable development goals and create new jobs, they need to have access to finance and be able to mitigate political and commercial risk. So, to cater for the needs of the private sector in its member countries, the Islamic Development Bank Group created three dedicated business arms. Working with ISDB Group organizations means you gain more support for your projects, Islamic finance for your trade, and Islamic insurance against business risk. The Islamic Corporation for the Insurance of Investment and Export Credit, or ISEG, helps to enlarge the scope of cross-border trade and facilitates foreign investment into IOC member countries. Our Sharia-compliant insurance and reinsurance solutions gives you the confidence to enter new markets, while minimizing risk and making your business more competitive. Well positioned in the credit and political risk industry, our range of products is widely accepted across the business community, helping member countries to grow their economies. The Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, or ICD, provides access to Sharia-compliant finance. Our mission is to help businesses like yours thrive and in turn boost the economic growth of the private sector in all our member countries. Islamic finance, mid to long-term finance, industry finance, large-scale infrastructure finance. Whether you're a deep-rooted establishment or a startup enterprise, our portfolio of finance solutions will help your business achieve its ambitions. We want businesses to flourish, and not just within their home markets. To catalyze trade, we founded the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation, or ITFC. By enhancing intra-OIC trade, we contribute to the growth of imports and exports in our member countries. Our solutions strengthen economies within, between, and beyond our member countries. With integrated trade solutions, including Sharia-compliant trade finance and trade development programs, our client partnerships are designed to ensure their business success. Together, our organizations address every challenge your business faces through a comprehensive partnership formula. ICD finances your projects. ITFC finances and boosts your trade deals. ISEEC ensures your investment and export transactions. And ISDB's Group Business Forum, Thicker, promotes synergy among ISDB group member countries. The result is a perfect ecosystem for your business to grow. Neden katılım bankacılığı biliyor musunuz? Aslında cevap çok basit. Katılım bankacılığı, birlikte kazanmayı, bununla birlikte inanç ve değerlerimizi yok saymadan kazanmayı esas alır. Katılım bankacılığı, yatırımlarınızın doğru yerlere kanalize edilerek hem sizlerin hem de bankanızın adilce kazandığı bir sistemdir. Nasıl mı? Bir işe yatırım yaptığınızı ya da emeğinizi koyduğunuzu düşünün. O işten alnınızın teriyle elde ettiğiniz kar ne kadar hakkınızsa, birikiminizi katılım bankacılığında değerlendirerek elde ettiğiniz kar payı da o kadar hakkınızdır. Bizce kazanç kadar nasıl kazanıldığı da önemlidir. Bu yüzden katılım bankacılığında şeffaflık esastır. Birikiminizin nerede, ne şekilde değerlendirildiğini bilirsiniz. Böylece bankanızın yaptığı yatırıma, dolayısıyla bu yatırımdan elde edilen kâra ve zarara katılım bankasıyla birlikte ortak olursunuz. Paranız hem kanuni düzenlemelere hem de faizsiz bankacılık ilkelerine uygun yönetilmiş ve değerlendirilmiş olur. Bu sayede birikimleriniz inançlarınıza ters düşecek alanlara değil, toplum sağlığına hizmet eder. Kısaca sizlere daima güler yüzlü ve kaliteli hizmet veren katılım bankacılığı, aynı değerlerle yoğrulmuş, aynı yoldan geçmiş, aynı toprağa basan, aynı havayı soluyan bizlerin bankacılığıdır. Gücümüzü birleştirip, birlikte üretmek, 
birlikte kazanmaktır. Çünkü siz kazandıkça, birlikte kazandıkça, omuz omuza bir oldukça biliyoruz ki Türkiye kazanır, Türkiye güçlenir. Türkiye katılımla güçleniyor. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation OIC, is the world's second largest international organization after the United Nations with almost 1.8 billion people and 57 member countries spread over four continents. Since its establishment 40 years ago in Ankara, the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries CESREC has been the first subsidiary organ of the OIC with the objective to serve the OIC and its member countries in the areas of statistics, economic and social research and training and technical cooperation. To strengthen the existing ties and cooperation between Islamic countries, there is an obvious need for reliable and consistent data and information. Serving as the Statistical Data Bank of the OIC, CESRIC contributes to the efforts of member countries to explore each other's potential and needs in order to enhance cooperation among themselves in various areas of socio-economic development. To serve this purpose, CESRIC collates and processes socio-economic statistics from the databases of national statistical officers of member countries and international organizations and disseminates a large number of economic and social statistical indicators through various statistical applications developed by CESRIC, such as the OIC Statistics Database, OIC Countries in Figures, and others. In addition, CESRIC serves as the Secretariat of the OIC Statistical Commission, the only OIC Corporation Forum in the field of statistics which convenes every year at the level of heads of the national statistical offices of the member countries and representatives of regional and international organizations to assess the possibilities for cooperation through exchange of views and best practices. In the field of statistics, CESRIC also organizes capacity building programs to share knowledge and experience among the national statistical offices of the member countries and improve their institutional capacities and human resources. 
In the field of economic and social research, Cesaric follows up, evaluates and analyzes the current socio-economic situation in the member countries and reports on this situation through its technical background research reports, which cover a wide range of areas, including, but not limited to, trade, education, health, agriculture, poverty, environment, science and technology, transportation, tourism, and vulnerable social groups such as children, youth, women, and elderly people. These reports identify the problems and challenges facing member countries in these areas and suggest solutions for cooperation. In addition to these reports, CESRIC contributes to the policy dialogue mechanism within the OIC framework by preparing and leading the preparation of strategy documents including programs of action, roadmaps and cooperation frameworks on various socio-economic fields and in accordance with the decisions and resolutions adopted by various relevant OIC platforms. CESRIC also shares the outcomes and findings of academic studies and papers in the field of development and cooperation in Islamic countries with the public through a quarterly published academic journal, Journal of Economic Cooperation and Development. The OIC member countries spread over almost 25% of the world land area on four continents and constitute 24% of the world's population with a wealth of natural resources, youth and dynamic human resources, fast-growing economies and strategic trading regions. The OIC member states are also a center of attraction owing to their historical, cultural and touristic values. However, although there are areas where these countries have relatively significant advantages, they are still lagging behind in many areas such as education, health, science and technology and human development. Their shares in global production, trade and foreign investment are still below the desired levels. CESRIC works to develop solutions to the various problems and challenges facing the member states through the cooperation and solidarity approach and by activating the great potential of these countries. CESRIC thus plays a significant role in enhancing the South-South cooperation within the OIC community by using various modalities such as institutional and human resources capacity building programs, seminars, workshops, symposiums, conferences and similar events for sharing knowledge and experience, field study visits, vocational education and skills training, cooperation portals, expert networks and rosters. Over the past few years, CESRIC has embarked upon several capacity building projects and initiatives that enhanced knowledge transfer in different contexts based on mutuality, unity and solidarity. While implementing several projects, CESRIC adopts a tripartite cooperation mechanism where member countries are actively involved to share knowledge, technology, expertise and best practices i.e. provider country, beneficiary country and CESRIC as facilitator. CESRIC also contributes to the development efforts of individual member countries by supporting disadvantaged groups such as refugees and asylum seekers through specific projects aimed at developing vocational and entrepreneurial skills. While facilitating the trans
Assalamu alaikum, uh, the distinguished participants. Very welcome to this uh, last session of the uh, event, uh, Tevalst Islamic Economics and Finance Conference. Uh, we will present you today uh, uh, very important uh, researches on uh, Sharia issues, legal issues, uh, and uh, circular economy as well. So I think you will uh, enjoy this last session. Uh, please uh, ask uh, or leave comment for on YouTube if you if you have any uh, any note on on this session. At the end of it, at the end of session, I will uh, deliver your questions to the participants. <coughs> inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So today, Brother Yusuf uh, from uh, Zaim University will be us. Brother Abdurazak Alaro from Nigeria uh, is together with us. Ömer Hoca, Ömer uh, Kaçkar from uh, Ibn Haldun University. Uh, thanks for joining us, Hoca. Uh, Eyüp uh, Asker, Dr. Eyüp Asker from Zaim University as well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Brother Sadiq from Malaysia, uh, I give my special thanks to joining as well. And uh, lastly, Brother Abdul Samet from Zaim University is together with us today. So let let me start with uh, the first uh, presenter, Brother Yusuf Chaz Yusuf. He will uh, present uh, a critical assessment of circular economy principle and concept under the sh under the objectives of Sharia and Maslaha perspectives. So it is a semantic content analysis. There are impressive findings for high wealth of mankind and other creatures. The, this digital platform is yours, Brother Yusuf, it is. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa uh, Good afternoon to everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today uh, presenting my research topic. As uh, Dr. Yusuf said, it's a critical assessment of circular economy concept and the principle under the object of Makassi like Sharia and Masala perspective. Uh, here, I will just show a brief outline. I will start with the introductions, then uh, research objective and the contribution to the existing board of knowledge. Then I will talk a little bit about the circular economy concept, then Makassi Dar Sharia, then talk about the research methodology uh, finding, then I will conclude with the findings. Uh, this day, uh, I will speak about a little bit introduction. Uh, the concept of circular economy has been playing a remarkable role with the primary concern on the environment, resource saving, and conservation, creating business opportunities through the recycling process, respect of the ecosystem and ecological balance. However, both the Quran uh, and the practice of the beloved God messenger, peace upon him, appreciate the ecosystem, ecological balance, and the natural resource conservation. The appreciation of the ecosystem is apparent in several chapters that bear the name of uh, animals and insects, for example, uh, Surat Bakara, meaning the cow, and Surah al nahli meaning the bees, Ankabul, the spider, and uh, namely uh, the, the ant. Also, resource conservation can be referenced from several verses where the extravagant use of resources is discouraged. For example, uh, Quran chapter 7, verse number 31, that's showing how the human being should behave on the utilization of the, of the resource. As God says, he created everything in proportions. This can be referenced from the chapter 54, uh, verse number 49, according to the 
Maudu translation. So all the above chapters and verses can be linked to the concept of circular economy. The objective uh, of my studies is the assessment of circular economy concept and the principle and the object of Makassi Dar Sharia, specifically to analyze how circular economy concept can promote and protect the object of Makassi Dar Sharia. As there have been researching studies uh, that is stressing on the significance of a uh, circular economy, however, least if not at all, have been focused on analyzing the relevance of the, uh, of the concept of the circular economy to the Makassi Dar Sharia. Furthermore, it is asserted that circular economy concept promotes cultural diversity and social justice. However, uh, it regards the religious values of which the primary objective is to promote the human well-being in a wider perspective. Therefore, the study is narrowing the gap from this angle, particularly by envisioning the concept of circular economy and Makassil al Sharia, whatever the available studies most focus on sustainable development, waste management, environmental issues, corporate social responsibilities, and the same perspective. Therefore, the study will be adding to the existing literature on the subject matter. Now, uh, let's see a brief introduction of how the circular economy concept is. Living organisms depend on each others, where one species foods, I mean, one species waste become the foods for another species. In the living systems, there's no land feed. Materials continuously flow, living organisms born, grow, and die. With the help of solar energy provided by the sun, the nutrient from it, they return to the soil safely. However, human beings have developed a linear approach through the extract, make, and the dispose mechanisms. For instance, when a brand new washing machines come out, the old one could possibly create a land field. However, this model cannot sustain for a long term in the world of finite resources. So what can be done? is changing our way of thinking by adopting a cyclical model where the goals of today can be the, the resource of tomorrow at the yesterday resource price. Therefore, circular economy concept involve a gradual decoupling of economic activity from the consumption of finite resources by designing waste out of the system. It is underpinned by the renewable power resources it aims at redefining growth by focusing on a positive society-wide benefit. It is based on three principles. The first of which to design out waste and pollution. The second to retain the products and the materials in use. And the third one is to regenerate the natural systems. Then how it works. There are two biological cycles. The first is the biological cycles, and the second is the technical cycle. In the biological cycles, where the foods and the materials related, uh, sorry, where the foods and the biological related materials, they are designed to return to the system through the process such as composting and anaerobic digestions. This can in turn regenerate the natural system such as soil. In the technical process, consists of material that do not biodegrade. It stresses to restore product component and the material through the approach like reuse, remanufacture, and the recycling process. To attain a successful circular economy, there are four building blocks. The first of which is circular economy design. Uh, the second is uh, developing a uh, business models. The third is a uh, reverse cycles. Uh, and the fourth one is a uh, enablers and favorable systems. I won't talk more much about this because the limitation of time. I will just move on. Also, uh, there are some school of thought in the circular economies. However, for the purpose of this study, I have just uh, selected some few five school of thought, and uh, I won't talk much about this uh, because of the limitation of time. But the first school of thought is the credit to credit 
the other is the performance economy, uh, biomimicry, uh, the other is the natural capitalism, and the industrial ecology. Now I will talk uh, Maqasid al-Sharia. What is the Maqasid al-Sharia? According to Imam al ghazar the objective of Maqasid al-Sharia is to promote the well-being of mankind, which stem in safeguarding their faith, their human self, intellect, posterity, and wealth. Whatever warrant the safeguarding of these five serve as a public interest and they are considered as desirables. According to Chepra, the term safeguarding in this context is not limited to the status quo, but also to promote the sustained improvement to achieve the state that can help human beings to continually improve their well being. Uh, after seeing the concept of my Makasida Sharia, then the research methodology, how I have been analyzed my study to elaborate my findings. The study employed the qualitative content analysis. Qualitative content analysis is a research instrument that's used to find out the existence of certain words or concepts in a, in a text or in a group of texts. The advantage of this type of analysis, it enables one to analyze other phrases that appear to have similar or equivalent meanings, but which are spoken differently. Therefore, the study analyzed how often the objective of Makasid al-Sharia, along with the five sub-objectives, such as life, uh, religions, and so, have been explicitly or implicitly intended or promoted throughout the concept and its principle, which I call is by invisible hand. Therefore, the use of this methodology combined with the start objective will also be served as a contribution to the existing body of knowledge. Now I will uh, talk some example from the uh, hadith uh, that can be linked with the concept of um, a circular economy. The circular uh, economy concept. I didn't remember the, two minutes, brother. Oh, sorry. Oh. I still have five minutes. Yeah, my, my watch is short. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. The concept of circular economy endeavor to promote biodiversity through various technological in innovations to protect the earth's finite resources, promote reforestation, and the ecological balance. Human beings, as a vision of God, are encouraged to protect their resources. There are some writings that have been quoted by Ibrahim Muslimi that throughout the practice of beloved prophet, peace be upon him, encourage believers to plant trees and to protect the existing one. It was also reported that the beloved God messenger, peace be upon him, told the believers to sympathetically not only uh, to human beings, but also to other living organisms. General findings. Circular economy concepts, uh, principles such as, which stress on the regenerating of the natural system, can also relate to the above narration from the, from the hadith. There are other, uh, some other hadiths, that, but I have quoted one here, uh, which say that planting trees is, a, is an act of arms givings, but I won't read this the whole because of the time. So here the table is showing the comparative analysis how the principle and the concept of circular economy can promote Makasil uh, Sharia in one way or another. For example, the, the first principle we say, we design out west, or sometimes they call it west is equal to. This principle intend to circumvent pollution and the disposition of toxic waste. This in time may directly protect life and indirectly uh, promote religions because it keeps the mental health free uh, from pollution. So a good mental health will enable human beings to perform some other spiritual things. The second uh, principle is uh, to keep the product and material in use. This stresses on the reuse, so on, on the source saving by extending the use of the existing product. Hence it minimizes the extraction of new materials that could be needed to make a new product. Therefore, 
by this principle will keep the, the wealth. Another is to regenerate the natural system. This principle intends to increase the productivity of natural resources such as soil, forest, water resource. This in turn can promote wealth and also implies keeping the resources for the future generation. Hence can promote and protect the future generation through the progeny. So in conclusions, the study examined the circular economy concept and the principle under the Makassir al-Sharia. So the study found out that the circular economy concept, in fact, is support Makassir al-Sharia objective in the following ways. For example, regions is promoted that indirectly by the measure to prevent pollution through the recycling process, depress the use of toxic energy resources such as fossil and the nuclear power sources. Life can be promoted uh, and protected through the principles such as celebrated biodiversity, which intend to promote ecological balance and the respect of human beings. Progeny can be indirectly promoted through the principle such as to regenerate the natural system, which intend to preserve the limited number of resources for the future generations. Intellect also can be protected through the principle to design up waste to reduce pollution. This will in turn keep the faculty of reasoning free from contamination with the toxic industrial products. Wealth also can be promoted through the principle of restorative system, which in turn to preserve the limited resources from excessive exploitation. Thank you for your attention, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, thank you, Brother Yusuf. Yeah, this theoretical economy should be more or should bring should be bring more uh, should be brought more by the islamic economists to the agenda the people should understand how much energy how much effort the earth gives to grow one uh, little uh, potato or how much effort or how much resources of the earth is spent when we switch from iphone 10 to iphone 11 uh, thanks, uh, and uh, the findings are interesting. Uh, uh, the Makassi Sharia and the circular economic concept is consistent. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, I will deliver if there is any comment or question at the end of session, inshallah. Thanks, inshallah. Thank you. So Nigeria is an uh, emerging hub for Islamic finance, and many researchers also uh, as well as professionals are uh, targeting the economy and want to know and learn more about the Islamic finance sector of the economy. So today here, uh, Professor uh, Abdul Razak Alaro is with us. He will uh, present his paper on a, an evaluation of products and services in the Islamic financial institutions in Nigeria. So uh, the paper finds uh, the reverse effect of sec secular law, which uh, many economists suffer from this problem, and uh, on Sharia compliance of IFIs, and bring solutions uh, or policy recommendations. So the stage is yours, uh, Brother Abdulazak. Please, thanks. Please open, open your mic. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I hope I can be heard now. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. First and foremost, let, let me begin by appreciating the organizers of this event, uh, Zaim University in Turkey, International Association of Islamic Economics as well as 30 of the Islamic Development Bank in Jeddah. Well, to go straight into the business of the day, because of this, uh, the, the insufficiency uh, of the time that we have at our disposal, I would like to begin now by sharing my screen. Um, can, you, can you see my screen now? Yes, Dr. It appears. Okay, okay. Um, 
So the paper is about evaluation of products and services in the Islamic financial institutions in Nigeria. And the idea uh, of the paper is to look at how the Islamic financial institutions in Nigeria have fared in the last 10 years or so. Um, Islamic banking and finance was introduced for the first time in Nigeria, not 10 years ago. I need to correct that impression. It was actually introduced as far back as in 1956, when a bank was licensed and incorporated as Muslim Bank West Africa Limited and had its headquarters, head office in Lagos, Nigeria. So it operated until in 1968 when the banking license of that bank was actually revoked. Then that was the first introduction of Islamic banking and finance into the country. Then there was another attempt in 1998 when Habib Nigeria Bank came on board. Unfortunately, after almost about 12, 13 years also, precisely in 2011, the bank also become, became defunct. And the third and the present experience that we have of having Islamic banking and finance started in 2012. And that was when Jaiz Bank, as the first full-fledged Islamic bank, was actually licensed in the country. So if you look at this uh, 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 short historical background of Islamic banking and finance, uh, you will agree with me that the situation is ripe for assessment. We need to assess how far they have fared so far in discharging their duties as Islamic banks or Islamic financial institutions. So this is the idea behind uh, the paper. Um, generally speaking, when we are talking of Islamic financial institutions, we'll be talking about banking sector, insurance sector, and the capital market. But for the purpose of this presentation, the focus of the paper is just on the banking sector. Uh, we have presently in Nigeria two full-fledged Islamic banks, uh, Jaiz Bank PLC and Taj Bank PLC Limited. Also, we have two window operations of conventional banks. Uh, we have Stalin Bank has a window, and SunTrust Bank is another Islamic window of a conventional bank. We also have a number of microfinance institutions. So I have tried in the paper uh, to look at most of the products and services that have been offered by these institutions, particularly the banks, the deposit money banks, the big banks, not microfinance banks. Um, let me begin by pointing out the first observation. I earlier said Islamic Bank was first introduced to the country in 1956. The second coming was in 1998, and the third and the present experience started in, 19, uh, in 2012. But it will surprise you, just as it surprises me to note, that the Islamic banking industry in Nigeria is still very small in size. When you compare the total asset of Islamic banks put together in the country, you compare that with the total asset of the conventional institutions, conventional banks, you will be surprised to note that it is still less, it accounts for less than 1%. In fact, to be precise, to quote, uh, to quote the figures coming directly from the regulatory authority, the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation, it only represented as far as 2000, June 2019, 0.49%. When we look at the total deposit, deposit of Islamic banks put together is still at a very low level of 0.53%. While all the financing facilities being put up, being rendered, being offered by these banks uh, is as low as 0.38%. So you will realize from these figures that uh, Islamic banks in Nigeria have actually not reached their potential. There are still a lot, a lot, there is still a lot to be done in order for this unique uh, uh, system of banking and finance to actually reach its potential. And that is what made me to raise a question here. Could the reason be the fact that there hasn't been much investment in the sector? I think to a large extent, the answer to that question may be yes. 
when you look at those banks that I mentioned to you now, take for instance, the two full-fledged banks that are in operation. Taj Bank up till today is only existing in one or two of the six geopolitical zones of the country. What that implies is that it, also, it only has presence in either one over six or two over six of the entire country. The, the, the story is not too different when you take another full-fledged bank, that is bank, uh, which of course has expanded to have branches in almost every state of the federation. But it will surprise you to know that in some very big cities where other banks are having five, eight, 10 branches, Jais Bank could hardly put up one or two or three branches. So I think uh, from my own perspective, there is a strong need for more investment in this sector. And mark you, Nigeria is a very huge, com is a very huge market for Islamic banking. You are talking of a country of more than 200 million in population and majority of whom are Muslims. So it's a very huge market and we take this advantage, this opportunity to invite even foreign investors to come and invest in this very promising sector of our economy. Uh, and it may interest you to know that when you look at the, 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 the ranking of the ease of doing business that is being produced year in, year out by the World Bank, Nigeria is performing incredibly well. It has been steadily progressing. So it's very, it's a very promising market. Now, um, I will now go straight to some details about what I've found in my assessment of the product and services of Islamic banks uh, presently uh, uh, in operation in the country. I have classified these into three and I will run through them very, very uh, quickly because of our time. I classify them into equity-based products. That is product that create partnership between the bank and their customers and the likes of Mubaraba, Musharaka, and the rest of them, as you can see on the screen. Now, let me go to my, observe, so my findings. Uh, uh, some of what I found in what those banks are doing as far as equity-based products and services are concerned. One, you know, is, 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 is a general principle, is a golden principle of Islamic commercial law. Benefit goes to damage and revenue follows liability. So that is why when we talk of Mudoraba, we are talking of a profit and loss sharing uh, business entity. When there's profit, you share. And when there is loss, you, all of you must also have a share of the loss. But what I've observed, what I've discovered is that perhaps because of um, the environment in which they are operating, some of these financial institutions are usually silent on the exception to the rule. What is that exception? Generally, the rule in Modora is that it is the capital provider, Robul Mal, that will bear the loss in terms of monetary or pecuniary losses, while the entrepreneur will only lose uh, whatever dividend or whatever wages or whatever profit he is expecting in any event of loss. But I've noticed that uh, systematically, most of these banks, or some of them to be precise, they are always silent about that very important Sharia exception. And that exception says, unless if the entrepreneur, the Modorib is found negligent, if he's found negligent, then he has to bear the loss. It's not every time that we put the loss on the capital providers. So they are not actually explicit in explaining this to their customers. The other observation in this respect is that most of them also deliberately and tactically avoid even mere mentioning of possible laws altogether in the contract. And you see from the Sharia perspective, the danger inherent is this, is that it may bring about what we call al uncertainty in the contract when I enter into a contract, believing that I am not liable in whatever case. And that is not the, the, that is not the situation under Mubaraba. It should be clearly stated in the contract document that you as a customer of the bank, you will actually be responsible for the loss if the bank is not found wanting, if the bank is not found negligent. But uh, most of those banks, perhaps because of the business environment, they are in competition with conventional banks, they don't want to 
uh, make that known to their customers that look, you may lose your money when you deal with us in Mubaraba. La Allah But this is the this is the right thing to be done because we are not uh, 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 we, 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 deceit must be avoided in any uh, contractual obligation under Islamic law. Let me move quickly to the next yeah. observation or the can, next. Can point. can you remind again? Like it is like two minutes, but we can add three <laughs> minutes to your job. Three more minutes. So you, yeah. Well, uh, okay. Let let me just okay. This is also very important. Yes. I've also sure. observed that what. Uh, Islamic banks and financial institutions are paying as, as profit to their customers is very, very low. In fact, I said it is ridiculously low. I have taken my time to sample a particular bank. I will never mention that uh, the name of that bank so that it will not be, uh, it will not negatively impact on their, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 on their outlook or on their uh, business. Um, look at it, for example. Somebody deposited um, more than $8,000 in a Modoraba fixed account for 60 days. And all he had at the end of the 60 days is less than $50. Can, can you call that one a profit? So I think they should look into this one. Look at what is militating against them in, in getting uh, attractive rates of profit to attract more customers. This may be responsible for the reason why they are still struggling to compete with conventional institutions. Yes, like I put it here, Islamic Bank is interest-free, but Islamic Bank certainly is not dividend or profit-free. People, when they come to deal with Islamic banks, they are looking for something in return, and we must take a critical look at that. And I think one of those reasons that may be responsible also from the legal perspective, let me talk now from the legal perspective. We have a law in Nigeria that regulates companies generally, Companies and Allied Matters Act. Section 267 uh, sub 4 of, the of that law says, a company shall not be bound to pay remuneration to directors, but where the company agrees to pay, the director shall be paid such remuneration out of the fund of the company. Now, let us define what is the fund of the company. In a non-banking sector as compared to the banking sector. When you look at the banking sector, what will be regarded as the fund of the company? The shareholders' money is usually a smaller amount of that. Look at this example in January 2019. Uh, Jais Bank declared that it has a deposit base of over 60 billion naira, whereas the share capital of that bank itself is just 25 billion. So you are talking of majority of funds belonging to the bank being that of the customers of the bank and not of the bank itself. So when the bank is to pay its directors, it has to look into that. Directors are treated as modori boon. They are the modori. And whatever they get must actually come from the profit, their share of profit, not from the totality of the fund of the bank, as the law says. Yes, the law says from the fund of the company. But there is a peculiarity here in the banking sector in the sense that what we call the fund of the company, what belongs to the customers is actually higher than what belongs to the shareholders. And that should be taken account of. Uh, some other issue is the issue of having what we call income smoothing mechanisms that most of these banks are practicing in the name of PER, Profit Equalization Reserve or Investment Risk Reserve. My observation here is that they are not explicit about what will happen when you take a percentage of profit belonging to a customer as a re as reserve. By the time that customer is going out of the business with you, is closing his or her account, what will happen to the reserve taking uh, 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 from his legitimately uh, owned profit before opting out of uh, uh, banking with your bank? So it has to be looked into. Um, I'm running out of time, but let me look at those, some of the salient points that may be of interest. Um, let me move now to the lease-based, Ijara, Morobaha. Now, let me talk about Morobaha now. Being, uh, uh, the fact is that most of these banks are practicing Morobaha, just as it is the case all over the world. But you, should, you, you, you observe that the way they structure their Morobaha, sometimes it gives rise to a lot of Sharia complications. 
you have an instance where both offer and acceptance is coming from one single person. You have a, 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 a situation where you can never be sure whether the ownership of the product that is being sold through Morabaha, whether the ownership has passed to the bank before it's selling or not, especially in what is known as service ijara, which I refer to as being MPO, Morabaha on use of or services. When you take Morabaha to deal in her time financing, education and training financing, Hajj and Umrah financing, now it is difficult for me and for every uh, uh, neutral observer to see at what point, because the service is moving directly from the service provider to the end user. If you say you are financing her time, you are financing education from, let's say, Zaim University to a student in Nigeria, that service will actually flow directly from Zaim University to the student. So in what way is the bank that is financing taking charge, taking responsibility, taking assuming liability, taking ownership of the service before transferring it to the customer? And you know it is very, very important in Sharia. Where there is no ownership, you can never claim dividend. It is certain. You have to own because it is when you own that you are liable. And Nabi Sallallahu and you can never claim profit where you are not liable. So this is another key point that I think those banks may have to pay special attention to in order to improve on their product and service. And finally, this is the last slide. It has to do with service-based uh, products in the Nigerian financial institutions. Let me take, for example, what is called Wakala Bil Sitmar. The practice this is safer for them. Instead of going into Mudoraba, they will prefer to go into Wakala Bil Sitmar for a simple reason. Because when you practice Wakala with your customers, you have a certain level of dividend coming to you at the end of the day. In Mudoraba, you have to wait until when there is profit, then you take your share of that profit. But Wakala will guarantee a non, a, a, a non percentage of profit for the bank at the end of the day. So most of them are preferring to use Wakala Bill Mark. But the problem comes in one area. They have as a strategy, as a way of attracting customers, they would declare what they call targeted rate of return. That, okay, when you give us $1 million, for example, you are expected to have at the end of the day 5%, 2%, 10%. It is not guaranteed, because if it is guaranteed, that will actually nullify the contract from the Sharia perspective. But they will call it targeted rate, expected rate of return. Now, the issue here is when only the target is achieved and the bank will have nothing to claim. Or when the target is surpassed, you have, you, you have expected 5 or 10%, but you now realize 15%. What will happen to the remaining? Some of them would like to say, we will take this as an incentive for having done well in managing your business. But all these ones will give rise to some Sharia issues that will have to be, we will have to look into them critically. Uh, and uh, I have to stop at this moment because I think I have overused my time and I wouldn't like to take uh, much of the time allotted to other speakers. But generally speaking, uh, those institutions are doing well generally speaking, but they need to look into those specific issues uh, with a view to improving their product and services and with a view to attracting more customers. Like I told you, the size of the banks in Nigeria is. Good, good to know. Uh, I think the- Still very, very small. And be it, I thank the university, I thank all the organizers. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alaro. Actually, from my point of view, between the jurisdictions, I can uh, observe two main approach. One is uh, market share oriented. The other one is Sharia compliance oriented. So. Uh, Malaysia, some GCC countries, I consider them more market share oriented economies. Mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan, Turkey, Sudan, I was considering those as uh, Sharia compliance. Sharia compliance. Exactly. Uh, uh, and uh, good, good to know that with uh, your existence in uh, Nigeria, 
Nigeria is one of the Sharia compliance sure. uh, focus. You are very correct in your observation. Thank That's you Allah. very correct. <laughs> Thank you Allah. And uh, those problems uh, are mostly uh, global, not only for Nigeria, but also for Turkey. Uh, for example, what is the gross uh, deposits, Mudarabe accounts, and what is the investable amount? There should be certain criteria, certain uh, standards for those. Uh, uh, I agree with you. But this uh, targeted return, Wakala uh, uh, it was uh, experienced uh, when this uh, turmoil happened because of the currency crash in Turkey. But mm. it, it brought a lot of Sharia uh, discussions, issues. Sharia issues. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we can share uh, our experiences here with you. Uh, Thank you very much. Also, uh, with Dr. Alaro, we will have uh, an interview uh, based on uh, on behalf of a uh, UN uh, project, inshallah. Uh, okay. Inshallah. Also, I will uh, deliver the questions if the audiences has for them. Thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Sharia boards, uh, they are mostly considered as a proof for a financial institution to be Islamic one. And uh, many researches have been conducted uh, on Sharia boards recently. Uh, and we see that transparency and diversity are always on the agenda. Uh, this research uh, will be presented by uh, Prof. Ömer Kaçka now. Uh, is prepared with a uh, co-author. Uh, let me introduce him to you as well. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Kemal Yilmaz from uh, both from Ibn Haldin University. He is, I think, the widest uh, range of jurisdictions are analyzed within the uh, within this research. Uh, good to good to know about more economies. Almost 52 economies and the financial institutions and the Sharia boards are analyzed. So I think all the participants, also audiences will enjoy. Uh, please, uh, Ömer Hocam, uh, this digital platform is yours. Hocam, please open your mic. Turn on your mic. Ömer Hocam, turn on your mic, microphone. Yes, please Hocam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me now? Yes Hocam, clear. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me and my team this opportunity to share uh, the results of our research on Sharia governance. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, our university, Ibn Hadun University, for the continuous support. Uh, and also, I would like to thank our uh, the, the, the research team. Without their hard work, this uh, project, this paper, uh, would not be completed. Uh, so let me start. Uh, we have very uh, limited time. Uh, as it clear from the title, uh, the general topic of this paper is on the Sharia governance. Uh, in fact, uh, it is examining the diversity elements in, uh, uh, in the Sharia board in uh, full-fledged Islamic uh, banks. Uh, uh, we are looking into the diversity from the regulatory perspective as well as from the uh, uh, empirical and actual practices in the Sharia board uh, composition in uh, full-fledged Islamic uh, banks. So we, uh, our sample will take uh, two institutions, IFSP uh, uh, and uh, IUFI. In IUFI, we have two documents also and on the empirical uh, perspective we are covering uh, we are uh, covering uh, the the, uh, uh, 
the Sharia boards in uh, about uh, 52 countries, Islamic banks, uh, in 52 bank, uh, in 52 countries. Altogether, we have about 238 Islamic banks. Uh, uh, of course, one uh, major observation is uh, the, the, the dire uh, lack of information about the Sharia board members. Uh, we can say easily that um, in our study, for example, we have about 50% of missing uh, information uh, on the Sharia board members, like on age, on uh, education background. Unfortunately, even we tried to uh, uh, contact the Islamic banks, but unfortunately, uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, major limitation of our uh, our study that the lack of information. Uh, can you can you please check? Is the screen shared? Is my presentation shared? Dr. Yusuf, can you hear me? Dr. Yusuf, can you hear me? Yes, Rojam, yes. Yes, uh, uh, is my presentation shared? Yes, shared. Okay, okay. Um, so this is uh, the, the, so we are again looking into the diversity from the regulatory perspective as well as from the empirical actual practices. Uh, let me go straight to the presentation. Uh, I will, might, uh, uh, skip the few uh, the first few uh, slides due to the limitation of time so as you can see here the presentation outline it is a background uh, the impact of diversity then we move to the research objective and methodology and we conclude with the findings and the concluding uh, remarks uh, I would like here to draw the attention that uh, to the knowledge to the best knowledge of the research team this, uh, this study is the first of its kind on the diversity uh, of Sharia board members, uh, which covered the diversity element. Uh, I mean, uh, we covered the age, the, uh, the education, the gender, the experience, uh, the nationality. Uh, and this is the, the, the significance of, uh, of this study uh, you know, stems from this fact. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, due to the limitation of time, I will skip all this, the background on go corporate governance, importance of, uh, you know, uh, 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 corporate governance and uh, how it gains the interest uh, recently, uh, especially after the global 2008 financial crisis, uh, which many believe that uh, a, a great deal of the blame is to, uh, to be on the lack of a uh, robust corporate governance and uh, in particular on the uh, corporate board. Uh, uh, obviously the corporate board, they have vital role in the success of companies because of the, uh, uh, the strategic decisions actually lay uh, at their hands. Uh, and uh, many believe that major failures in the business uh, world have been due to the due, uh, 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 due to the ill-fated decisions of corporate governance. Uh, and from there, uh, the issue of diversity and come to focus as a hot topic in corporate governance. Uh, so the question is, does the diversity in, 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 uh, in board, does it really matter? Uh, and here, when we talk about the diversity, uh, even though the gender is the most debated topic, but diversity in, in it is comprehensive uh, uh, meaning, it includes not only gender, gender but also age, uh, education, religion, race, culture, etc. So what does the literature say about the uh, uh, diversity? We have a lot of studies confirmed the positive impact of diversity in the corporate uh, or in the board uh, on the financial performance of corporate and uh, uh, study and, uh, and companies. We have here uh, a number of studies. Uh, um, I need to skip 
due to the limitation of time. And uh, now here also we ask the question, why corporate governance in Islamic banks uh, is different? And uh, of course, the uniqueness of corporate governance in Islamic financial institutions in general, and Islamic finance in Islamic banks in particular, stems the fact that uh, um, the, the, the Islamic banks need to abide to uh, a multi-layer or a dual model of corporate governance, meaning that uh, in, in the uh, Islamic banks, we don't have only the corporate governance, but also we have the Sharia governance. Uh, and also, in addition to the uh, traditional corporate board, we have a special Sharia board to check the compliance of all uh, products and services of uh, Islamic banks with uh, Sharia. Uh, and also, in addition to that, we have the principal agent problem in uh, Islamic banks is more evident due to the business model, which normally says, uh, support or encourage the uh, profit and loss uh, sharing. So here we come to the uh, research objective. As I uh, highlighted earlier, we have the theoretical objective as well as the empirical objective. So in the theoretical objective, we, uh, in our study, we surveyed the provisions uh, on diversity in the current Sharia uh, governance framework. We have covered two institutions and about 10 uh, uh, countries. Uh, we will highlight that later. And also, in the empirical, we have surveyed, uh, uh, mostly manually, as I said, this is due to the lack of information and also to the normally non responsive uh, 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 communications or not fruitful communications with the Islamic banks. And even we tried to develop a survey, uh, but unfortunately, the results are not very uh, much encouraging. So yeah, that's why we, we, we collected, the majority of our data has been collected uh, manually on the uh, diversity elements on the Sharia board members. So we covered uh, about uh, 380 plus Sharia scholars in, uh, in about uh, 200 plus uh, Islamic banks in 50 plus uh, country. Uh, so we used uh, the qualitative uh, research and the document analysis. Uh, these are the, uh, the institutions and countries. Uh, we covered IUFI and IFSP. IUFI has two documents, the Sharia governance uh, standard number one and Sharia governance standard number eight. So we covered two, uh, two of them. And also we covered these countries to check for the provision on uh, diversity in the Sharia board. Uh, uh, so this is the selection criteria. We covered only fully fledged uh, commercial banks uh, on, uh, and the international subsidiaries. We excluded Sharia windows, excluded uh, subsidiaries and financial institutions other than the Islamic banks. And these are some of the, uh, our results. As we can see here, uh, the majority of this uh, uh, regulatory framework on Sharia governance uh, did not capture the many of the diversity elements, such as the gender, the age, the nationality. Uh, here, we'd like to draw the attention, or we'd like to underline that in IOFI, in the latest uh, Sharia governance standard number. Uh, eight, they highlighted they have a special paragraph on diversity, uh, but maybe not, not really the direct. Uh, for example, here, the IUFI uh, standard states that, for example, on the represent representation from within the country uh, jurisdiction or uh, global uh, scholars, this is internationality and also highlighted the representation from different schools of thought and also different field of expertise. And also, this is very important also on the, on the gender, uh, they, they, they highlighted that uh, no discrimination should be uh, happen against any uh, potential female uh, members. Uh, so now, uh, this, the, 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 the findings, uh, in these countries, in the regulatory, in the national regulatory framework. Of, of John, kind reminder for last two minutes. 
Okay, uh, thank you. So again, it, uh, the majority of these national didn't capture the uh, diversity elements, unfortunately. Uh, so these are the banks uh, and countries and uh, the number of Sharia scholars is the summary. And these are the summary we, we can see, for example, here in the Middle East, we covered 19 countries, 252 uh, banks and 160, uh, 33, uh, six uh, Sharia scholars. Uh, also, we have covered in our research on the uh, multi, uh, multiple directorship among the Sharia scholars who are sitting on uh, more than one uh, Sharia board. We, for example, uh, we have found one of them uh, sitting on 17 Sharia board, one on 15 and so on. Uh, for example, also we have found that 300 plus of the Sharia scholars are sitting on only one uh, board. Uh, in regard to educational background, we have found that some diversity could be uh, observed. For example, two thirds uh, or 65 uh, of the Sharia uh, board members, uh, education uh, was Sharia specialization. We have also about 19% uh, on non-Sharia field, and we have 16% on mixed, uh, for example, Islamic banks, uh, Islamic finance, so we consider it as mixed. Uh, on the nationality, also these are the nationality of these Sharia uh, members uh, in our study. Uh, we can say, for example, here, this is the top 10 uh, uh, countries with the most uh, Sharia scholars. We have uh, Bangladesh, 55, uh, Malaysia, 33, Saudi Arabia. So here we'd like to um, highlight that the results of this uh, research is uh, might not be uh, uh, or might not reflect the actual representation from these countries. This is due to uh, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that different countries or different jurisdictions have different models of uh, Sharia governance. Uh, for example, some of these countries have no uh, central, uh, no regulation on central Sharia board, some of them, uh, for example, have nine Sharia board sitting, like uh, the case in Bangladesh. Some of them have only one uh, Sharia uh, member sitting on the board. Uh, so these are, again, the, the number of international. Also, we have covered the international scholars. These are the numbers. And this is the top uh, 10 countries. We have the 16 from Bahrain. These are the number of international scholars, meaning the non-Bahraini scholars in Islamic banks in Bahrain. Um, I need to go a little bit fast, uh, excuse me. Uh, now we come to the gender issue. The gender issue, I think that this is the most uh, striking fact that uh, there is no gender diversity in, uh, in Sharia board in Islamic banks, and this could be expected. We have uh, observed only six female scholars in Bangladesh, Brunei, Malaysia, and Tunisia. And this needs to be uh, really uh, examined, the, 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 the underlying uh, 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 reasons uh, behind this. Uh, oh, last, last minute. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is the last uh, two uh, slides. Uh, we can see here for also on the age uh, perspective, uh, as expected also, the majority of the Sharia board are above 60. Can, we can see here, 46 of our sample uh, are uh, 60 uh, years old and above. We have only 4% from 30 to 40, etc. So I'm coming now to the concluding remark. Now, uh, obviously, Islamic finance industry, if they want to have the uh, uh, the acknowledgement and the accreditation from the uh, Islam, from the financial industry, they need to work harder on the uh, diversity issue to improve the diversity in their uh, uh, Sharia board. Uh, also, uh, as I highlighted, on the regulatory level, uh, the, the diversity is almost non-existent. Uh, we only have in the latest IUF governance standard number eight, some uh, reference to the diversity. Empirically also, uh, we can say it is um, uh, the, the diversity on edu education, for example, it is 
to some extent it is uh, into the acceptable level uh, but in some perspective uh, such as in the in the agenda it is uh, it need a huge improvement uh, some further research could be to expand the research to include uh, other Islamic financial institutions and maybe Islamic windows and also to explore some uh, relationship or correlation between the diversity elements and some uh, dependent variables such as financial performance uh, uh, and uh, CSR uh, disclosure, for example. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I come to the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Thank you for uh, uh, listening. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, insightful uh, research. Uh, good to listen. Good to see the figures. Inshallah, uh, if you can share the presentation, would be great. Inshallah. So, Inshallah. At, at uh, five thirty p.m., we will have the closing uh, session. So we we will not have an extra time in the end. So please uh, go go past the uh, uh, participants. I can give nine minutes to each. And I recommend you to answer uh, or follow up the comments on uh, YouTube channel, please. So uh, the next presentation will be presented by uh, Dr. Uyi Paske, uh, co-author of the paper with Ibrahim Guran Yumshan, and evaluation on compliance with IOF accounting standards by participation banks in Turkey. In recent years, there have been significant developments in Turkey on Islamic finance. And one of them the, was the intro, introducing of accounting standards uh, for Islamic financial institutions first time ever. So I think this study is one of the initial uh, systematic analysis of this research. Ojan Pili is only nine minutes and I don't have any extra uh, except my uh, excuses. Thanks. Okay, inshallah, I'll be very brief. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, I will. I will respect the deadline uh, time. Let me please allow my presentation. It is in full screen now. Can you see it full screen? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, in recent times, uh, a lot of studies and works have been done for AOF standards, to apply AOF standards in participation banks in Turkey. Uh, as it is well known, uh, there are six participation banks in Turkey, and all of them currently apply uh, Turkish financial reporting standards. And those who have, uh, those participation banks who have a uh, main shareholder abroad, they apply IFRS compliant uh, financial report. They prepare IFRS compliant financial reports also. Uh, what, after the analysis and uh, lots of studies, we see that uh, Turkish financial reporting standards and IFRS standards are not fully convenient for the products or accounting of Islamic banks or participation banks in Turkey. In this paper, uh, what's proposed is that participation banks in Turkey, in addition to Turkish financial reporting standard and IFRS reporting, should prepare financial reports by taking into consideration AOV standards also. Uh, I want to uh, take your attention here. We don't say that let's leave uh, TFR, uh, TFRS reporting or IFRS reporting. What we say, what we propose is to, to bring an additional financial reporting uh, to Turkey, which is, uh, which is compliant with AOV standards. And what we believe is that applying the AOV standards, uh, which are fully complied with the Islamic principles, may bring lots of benefits to participation banks in Turkey. Uh, let me briefly explain uh, what is accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institution. It was uh, registered in Bahrain in 1991 as a non-profit making organization. Among the founder members are uh, Islamic Development Bank, Faisal Group, Al Raji Bank, Dalla El Baraka, Kuwait Finance House, Al Buhari Foundation. It has more than 200 institutions members, and among these uh, institutions, there are uh, central authorities, uh, like, for instance, in Turkey, Banking Regulation and Supervision Authority. Uh, let me briefly explain objectives of uh, AOFI. 
uh, to prepare promulgate and interpret accounting auditing governance ethic and sharia standards to harmonize the accounting and auditing practices and procedures adopted by uh, islamic financial institutions to disseminate accounting and auditing thoughts relevant to islamic financial institutions through training seminars publications and other means and in addition to these objectives uh, aop also gives some uh, certifications programs also currently uh, ifrs is applied almost uh, by 98 countries more than maybe 100 countries in the world uh, tfrs which is uh, applied only by turkey uh, it's actually tfrs is the translation of uh, ifrs but blended with local regulation brsa regulations also uh, aop currently applied by almost 45 countries in the world uh, five of them, five of these countries, uh, which are Bahrain, Qatar, Jordan, Sudan, and Oman, they apply compulsorily or uh, obligatorily AOV standards. Uh, and remaining 40 countries, they apply AOV standards voluntarily or as a guidance. Uh, as it is uh, shown here in Turkey, six participation banks. Uh, none of them apply AOP currently, and uh, all of them apply only Turkish financial reporting standards. And those who have uh, main shareholder abroad, they apply IFRS uh, standards also while preparing the financial statements on a quarterly basis. Uh, I want to respect the deadline, that's why I skipped these slides. I want to come to main differences between okay. IFRS standards Turkish financial reporting standards and IOFI standards. Very briefly, time value of money, uh, there is a, a difference here. Both IFRS and uh, Turkish financial reporting standards, uh, they apply discounting future cash flow into today by net present value formula, both of them. But AOV is against uh, this net present value formula because money should not have time value, but only economic sources may have, may have it for instance, uh, like rent. Substance over form issue is another difference between these three types of set of standards. Uh, bo both according to IFRS and uh, TFRS, substance over form, substance come first. But in AOP, both of them, both substance and form are equally important. I don't want to enter into details of these uh, terminologies, uh, I want to uh, skip a bit fast. Fair value, uh, fair, AOP is not against fair value approach, but discounting is the issue. Uh, both of both IFRS and TFRS, they apply discounting methodology. Uh, in According to materiality perspective, materiality is based on some calculated thresholds in both IFRS and TFRS. So it is, it's a mathematical calculation, but in but AOP, for problem. instance, yeah, in AOP, AOP, for instance, there is a haram element also. I skip this part and I want to come to benefits of applying uh, AOP standards in Turkey. What we believe is that uh, if we apply AOP uh, standards and if we prepare, if participation banks in Turkey prepare financial statements according to AOP, uh, it, it will have more many benefits uh, to be aligned with the Islamic sector in the world, which is reached uh, to two trillion US dollar, to benefit more from the capital movement in the Islamic financial sector, and to get more share from scoop market in the world, which is a widespread Islamic product, to attract more foreign direct investment, especially from Gulf region, and to benefit more from merge and acquisition around the world, to make the financial reports prepared by the participation banks more transparent, comparable, and comprehensive. What we see is that this item is very important. We, we uh, believe that we suggest that if participation banks in Turkey prepare uh, AFW compliant financial reports, it will, uh, support the unif uh, it will support the integrity and transparency between all Islamic institutions in the world. In this paper, in conclusion, in this paper uh, for tur Turkish participation banks, it's proposed to apply AOP by taking into consideration some local regulations of BRSA 
and also a central sharing of our comments or advices. To prepare Islamic accounting standards blended with AOP, PRSA regulations, and central Sharia board comments. To prepare these Islamic financial reports at least once in a year by all participation banks, in addition to Turkish financial reporting standards and IFRS reporting. To publish these audited financial reports in public disclosure platform in Turkey, as it is done with uh, TFRS reporting. Thank you for giving me opportunity in this international conference. Hocam, thank you very, very much for uh, using time efficiently and uh, again, insightful discussions. Uh, it can be volunteer, I think. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for uh, sharing and sorry for squeezing the uh, end of the session, but uh, uh, l let me catch the uh, closing session, inshallah. The next paper, uh, is from uh, Malaysia, uh, Saadi Komala, Umar Husseini, and uh, Hafsa Ibrahim Kamal, distinguished participants and distinguished res researchers on the field. And uh, it is a qualitative analysis on primary and secondary resources. Uh, and this research is pioneering uh, on uh, fintech and legal analysis. Uh, actually, it is a chance to have such researchers and such researchers for Islamic finance field. Uh, so this uh, digital platform is yours, brother uh, Sadek, uh, and the paper is on the implications of digital estate in Sharia compliant fintech legal analysis, please. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, and the presentation is uh, on screen. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, this is a conceptual paper. Uh, we're not going to uh, any empirical data yet. This is just at the early stage. Uh, we're trying to look at the implication of uh, digital estate in Sharia compliant uh, fintech uh, industry. As we all know uh, that, fin I want to go through the outline because it's uh, time constrained, but as we know that Fintech is growing globally, and we have the Sharia compliant Fintech in uh, Muslim countries. So there are some legal implications. But before we go into the uh, discussion, we're gonna have the meaning. What do we mean by digital assets? Before we can talk about digital estate, we need to understand what is digital assets. From the literature, we can find few uh, meanings, uh, one of which is the digital asset is any form of content or media that have been formatted into binary sources or this is just digital uh, elements in it. From the common law perspective, we have uh, the word estate. This is the second word from the, apart from digital, we have the second word estate, which is given as anything that has what, that gives the net worth of a person at any point in life or in death. This is the most important thing, either in life or in death. So we can say that digital estate has four main features. One is it is capable of being owned by someone. It is electronic and as well, it has value. And the last feature is that it is transferable, okay? So in the banking system, we have lots of assets. However, FinTech relies on digital form of assets. And we uh, hypothesize that FinTech has the uh, possibility and probability of creating more uh, digital estates and unclaimed funds. Why do we have this kind of hypothesis? Why are we saying that fintech can create more uh, digital estates? We get to that discussion later. But before we go on, we also need to talk about the scope of uh, Sharia compliant fintech. As we know, in the Muslim world, we have uh, we, there's a need for financial inclusion. One of the tools of financial inclusion is fintech, the use of IT tools. 
So Sharia fintech or Sharia compliant fintech is guided by what is, uh, the ethics and guidelines of the uh, Islamic law. These are some of the things that we were able to find in literature. And also, we also need to know that Sharia compliant fintech has the feature of creating financial digital assets across different platforms. This paper is not focusing on mentioning platforms because we want to, as much as possible, focus on the digital estates or digital assets. So we are not referring to the, the various platforms that exist in the Muslim world. So we hypothesize that the regulation on, uh, on claim funds and uh, stolen, missing assets in the mining industry is currently inadequate to protect uh, the loss of wealth in the fintech space. How with the uh, wealth? How is wealth uh, lost? We we'll get to the discussion uh, as we go on. One of the features of uh, fintech, Sharia compliant fintech, or whether it's Sharia compliant or not, is the fact that it is customer centric. It's focused on the customer. So the bank or the platform tries as much as possible to deliver uh, technology banking to the consumer. So, however, while doing this, it appears that the banks do not consider the afterlife of the consumer. So this means that digital estate is created, and in a way, there is some form of digital intestacy. Digital intestacy in law means that uh, the consumer dies without uh, preparing for what will happen to the estates or any property. So the methodology we, we use in this uh, study is just uh, doctrinal research, as we all know, and we try to look at uh, the different uh, concepts which are re relevant in this situation. The first concept which is relevant in digital asset and digital asset is uh, wealth management. And as we all know also in FinTech space, you have the need of ICT. ICT is very important to uh, digital estate. And lastly, the third concept which is relevant is also the Islamic finance law and regulation. So this is the general scope of the characteristics of digital estate and digital assets. The difference between digital estate and digital assets resides in the change or the occurrence that can happen between asset and estate. An asset is as far as the person, the owner of the asset is alive. As long as the owner is alive, it remains an asset. However, where the person dies or where there is lack of awareness of the account of the, of the owner by the legal heirs, or where, for last minute. Where, where an account is abandoned, this means that it becomes a digital estate. And these are some of the features. It's completely personalized. There's privacy and confidentiality only on the part of the account holder. The information regarding the asset or the estate is only with the account holder. It's intangible, meaning that you cannot hold it. There is no uh, physical proof, only in electronic proof. And the third uh, characteristic is that it is stored remotely. So this means that it's not accessible to the successor or the uh, legal ears of the uh, owner. And lastly, it's secured and there is no uh, third party access. So these are the features. So what does Islam law say about uh, property rights of individuals. We try to explore some of the principles in Islamic law. There are description of uh, digital asset or property as uh, a mulk. And also uh, we have a similar concept like uh, amwal, which refers to wealth. And these are some of the things we can find in the literature. So we have to go uh, quite fast. And all these causes of digital instability have been discussed in a previous slide where we talk about the characteristics of uh, digital intestacy. So now let's look at the relevant concepts that we might apply to unclaimed funds and digital estates. Two concepts you can find in uh, Islamic legal tradition. One is the concept of uh, doctrine of Lukta, 
and the second is the doctrine of vital mass. The doctrine of Lokta basically talks about uh, finding a treasure. How do you deal with finding a treasure? How, how should a lapid, the finder, uh, uh, deal with finding a treasure? There are the hadiths of the Prophet that I mentioned about announcing the item for one year. In other tradition, you mentioned about three years before it can be uh, used by the lapid. The second print, uh, uh, doctrine is doctrine of battle mal. That is treating the uh, funds or digital assets as a form of uh, missing property and return to the uh, battle mal of the Muslim. However, also we all know that the concept of battle mal. How many minutes? One minute. Forgive me for that. <laughs> okay. So as we all know that the concept of battle mal is elusive right now. So uh, it's, let's look at what uh, other countries uh, do. In Saudi Arabia, we have rules on uh, missing funds. In Malaysia also, there's a huge amount of uh, missing funds, which uh, there, there are laws for that. But these laws are not capable of dealing with digital assets or digital estates. So that is why uh, in preliminary, we try to see the effect on the general uh, share of fintech industry and we had a few uh, recommendations on this. One is that we should, uh, fintech companies should consider enhanced KYC in which they will try to uh, see that they will get uh, more details from the customer at the point of uh, uh, opening the account. And secondly is that they should have a digital estate policy. How do we deal with uh, digital assets when uh, it becomes uh, unclaimed? And the third is WAF treatment for digital estate. This is a source of fund for WAF in future. And the fourth is at the time of testing softwares, fintech softwares through the sandbox, there should be provision for uh, digital estate. And lastly, the telecommunication companies and ISPs can be of help in trying to solve the problem of uh, unclaimed funds and digital estates. So we will be expecting more uh, feedback uh, as, as this is a preliminary uh, discussion on how to move further in uh, this, uh, our paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Sadek. Uh, this is a very good achievement. I would love to read the final paper. And uh, again, I uh, recommend the audiences to send the, uh, to type the comments on YouTube channel or questions and I encourage our audiences to do that so our uh, participants can uh, respond uh, on uh, YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, this is the last, uh, last paper, seven minutes left. Uh, thanks for understanding and uh, helping me on that. Uh, Brother Abdul Samad will present this paper. Uh, the merits of legal capacity for creating work compared to the trust law in the Western yes. legal system. Uh, with the shift uh, of legal paradigm to capitalism in the late 18th century, 19th century, um, work model has yes, been... Please, doctor, if you, if you kindly uh, remove your uh, screen, stop Minister. your... Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, it is shared. Yes, it is it shared with you? Yes, it is. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to thank the organizers of the uh, conference for giving me this opportunity to present my paper which is about the merits of legal capacity for creating waqf compared to the trust law uh, in the Western legal systems. I also thank my professors, Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Sharif Al-Emri and Dr. Mustafa Omar Muhammad for uh, providing...
for providing uh, uh, support. Uh, uh, outline of the paper is uh, introduction and the research problem, the objectives, uh, methodology, findings, results, and uh, conclusion. Uh, in the introduction, the uh, importance of WAF is discussed. WAF played an important role in the prosperity of the Islamic society. And this uh, important role have been uh, in enhanced uh, by the recognition of legal capacity for creating wealth. Uh, the legal capacity uh, as a component uh, has protected the rights of the work of parties against mismanagement. Actually, when we recognize legal capacity for work of, uh, it means that uh, we provided flourishing environment for Waqaf to grow more. So today also Waqaf contributes to education, healthcare, infrastructure, public amenities, investment, mosque, graveyards, and also other areas. So this legal capacity con uh, 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 concept is discussed and compared in the Western legal system especially in the United States, how they recognize this legal capacity. Uh, and uh, they actually do not recognize legal capacity for trust. So this has implications for trust, trust arrangements uh, because there the appointed trustee is the person or entity with the capacity to undertake legal formalities for the trust properties. So the research problem is that uh, legal capacity is an integral part to the work of in Islamic uh, traditional literature and also in the contemporary modern legal system of most Muslim countries. So this uh, concept needs to be compared in the trust status in the Western legal systems. So according to my uh, study, uh, there is limited literature that examines the extent uh, to which the legal capacity of work is effective in the protection of work of properties and how such protection is covered in the law of the trust. So there is knowledge gap uh, regarding how the legal capacity of work is effective in the protection of work of in Muslim countries uh, legal system in comp comparison to the Western countries. Uh, the objective uh, of this uh, research is that to examine the legal capacity of work of properties in the traditional literature of Islamic studies and in the contemporary legal system of Muslim countries. The second objective is to examine the extent to which legal capacity is critical in sustaining work of properties for the benefit of the society and the needy people. Uh, it is also uh, the objective of this research to examine how legal capacity compares with the legal system of the United States on law of trust and management of its uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the li literature review, uh, which I have done, um, uh, you will find that in the Islamic fiqh literature. And yeah, uh, most scholars discuss the uh, different dimensions of the uh, work of. Some discuss the contracts through which uh, work of can be created. Some discuss the legal entity of work of, and some created that uh, work of institution needs to uh, enter into contracts with other people. But this study uh, is uh, uh, unique because. Uh, uh, this study uh, discussed the legal capacity of Waqaf in traditional Islamic uh, uh, system and in the contemporary legal system. And it uh, explained that how the recognition of legal capacity uh, play important role in the protection of Waqaf properties and prevents mismanagement. And also it is compared with the Western legal systems. 
The methodology is qualitative methodology. Uh, and the findings which are very important are that uh, uh, recognizing legal capacity of work is work of is important for creating confidence among the society regarding the work sustainability of work of it also uh, protect work of from the transgressors and will provide flourishing environment for work of properties it is also uh, found that uh, the Muslim countries should um, uh, improve the regulations about the legal capacity of Waqaf. And it is also found that the US legal system does not recognize legal capacity for Waqaf. And uh, uh, the uh, legal system of the United States, the, the trustee is the party uh, who can uh, represent Waqaf in the court and the legal capacity in Sharia is recognized and uh, in the most Muslim countries legal systems. So the result of the, uh, the research is that it, each work of declaration uh, creates legal person uh, and uh, the administrators and the managers or institutions, they can be treated as Nazir or Mutawalli and they have duty to the work of entity and the recognition of work of legal capacity enable them to sue people and can be sued in the court and it owns lands in its own name and exist forever in perpetuity. And we, the, the work of uh, the, is recognized to have legal personality. It brings the Nazir or the managing administrator under the duty to protect the interest of work of. And this will eliminate the any negligence or ignorance of the management towards the work of properties. So the conclusion is that for the protection of work of and its effective management, it is necessary that the authorities consider the status of work of legal capacity and the concept of legal uh, capacity in the existing uh, work of institution must be enhanced. And further studies can leverage on this study and uh, the uh, research can be extended uh, to other areas of legal capacities in the contemporary work of uh, environment. Thank you. Uh, up to Samet Ojam. Up to Samet Ojam says for uh, your. Thank you, Ojan. Thank you very much. Uh, what I was trying to explain about the uh, uh, work model, that it had difficulties with capitalist legal paradigm after late 18th centuries, uh, but yeah. still embedded in the societies. Yani. And uh, this was a very important discussion uh, on work legal capacity. There is, an, there is a way for uh for our uh, civilizations institutions to to survive and to uh, help uh, improving uh, the overall wealth of the mankind inshallah so please uh, all the uh, participants open your uh, uh, turn on your video and join me for closing uh, first of all I, I want to thank you all of you very insightful discussions and uh, good to good to be with you today. Uh, I'm glad to have different uh, participants from different uh, regions, continents, and uh, I, I I just really felt the uh, science, the 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 spirit of the science uh, is traveling uh, through the technology, and uh, we had the opportunity to to yeah. uh, have it. So uh, I want to thank, uh, also thank you, audiences yes, thank as well. You. Thank you and, very much. And I again, was connected from, from Afghanistan. MashaAllah, <laughs> salam And I, I again uh, recommend my uh, our audiences to uh, leave the comments and uh, questions on YouTube so our participants will respond soon. And I want to thank to the uh, organizer uh, to giving me this opportunity. And I want to give special thanks to this uh, uh, infrastructure to be uh, uh, prepared and 
help us to uh, conclude that uh, uh, conference uh, with the closing session. And uh, I recommend our audiences to follow up the closing session as well uh, uh, for the closing remarks. There will be insightful discussions of Prof. Mehmet Pulut, Prof. Azmi Omer, Dr. Sami Suvenin, and Prof. Ari Persoy. Thanks for joining joining us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you very much. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yusuf. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank hope, you. To, hope to see you all in Istanbul, inshallah. Hope to see you, inshallah. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Wa Alaikum.
Okay. Uh, Bismillah. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah. Uh, dear uh, colleagues, friends, participants, followers uh, from all of the world. We uh, are now in the final session, in the, this closing session. Uh, we will make a summary what we have done in uh, all week. Uh, and uh, I will give 15 minutes to each speakers for analyzing the conference. And uh, before that, I want to start to make a summary. As uh, you know, the 12th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance was held successfully online during an extended period of a whole week from 14 to 20 June 2020 under the theme Growth, Equity and Sustainability and Islamic Perspective because of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is perhaps in the first time that modern technology and social media was used extensively in such a big international conference in its history. The conference was jointly organized by the International Association for Islamic Economics and Finance and Islamic Research and Training Institute Purti, of the Islamic Development Bank Group in collaboration with uh, Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University uh, as the main organizer and supported by the Turkish Participation Banks Association and also with uh, the supported by Hamafe University, the Statistical Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries and uh, Independent Industrialist and Businessman Association, NUSIAD, as well as uh, the uh, universities from Turkey and the institutions. The conference was opened by me, Professor Mehmet Bulut, as the president of Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University. The inaugural speech was given by Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the President of the Republic of Turkey. The conference provided a platform for dialogue, discussion and exchange between scholars, policymakers, practitioners, as they collectively seek to address the challenges of sustainable development in the fourth industrial revolution era from the perspective of Islamic economics and finance. Under the broad theme of the conference, sustainable development for the real economy, 132 papers were presented and discussed in 24 parallel sessions, one Turkish, five Arabic and 18 English sessions. This is in addition of 14 keynote speeches by eminent speakers from different parts of the world, including Dr. Berat Albayrak, Minister of Treasury and Finance from Turkey, Dr. Abdul Hafiz Sheikh, Minister of Finance from Pakistan. The presented papers focused on areas such as the role of Islamic economics and finance in the fourth industrial revolution, Human being focused real economy, digital economy, circular economy, sharing economy, and especially Islamic social finance, which emphasize wakfs and zakat and Islamic microfinance as very important instruments that need to be implemented to give more boost to financial inclusion, empowerment, and entrepreneurship in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. After through deliberations over a period of seven days, the participants adopted the following resolutions. 
The world today we live in needs more than yesterday to the models and systems based on Islamic economics and finance. Islamic economics and finance is based on human being, human focus. It is a natural economy and finance. So that means not only for Islamic countries and Muslims, but also for the rest of the world needs this approach, this paradigm, models and systems from this rich heritage. Second, the conference organizers and participants express their deepest sympathies with those who have suffered from COVID-19 and offer their condolences to the families of the martyrs who succumbed to this epidemic. At this point, Professor Dr. Sabri Orman passed away before, just before the, starting the conference, and we say, Rahim Allah, and I hope we pray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come together us in his uh, Jannat, Jannat al Firdaus, inshallah. They pay home to the frontline health workers who served devotedly despite serious risks for their lives and saved thousands of lives. They also record their appreciation for the governments of Muslim countries who rose up to the situation and provided financial support to face this challenge despite their already tight budgets. Third, the participants noted that COVID-19 has given a wake-up call to, the, to most Muslim countries that their regular health budgets for treatment as well as for health research have been miserably low, putting too much pressure at the time of such an emergency. Fiscal reform to provide regular resources for the health sector, which is one of the basic needs, is urgently required. Fourth, the pandemic has tested the effectiveness and resilience of preparedness in such emergencies. The conference notes that the, the global community did not manifest the requisite spread of cooperation and multilateralism to face such outbreaks. The conference calls for strengthened cooperative institutions at local, regional, national, and international levels. Fifth, the conference noted that elderly, the underprivileged, and the minority communities have suffered the most and calls for prevention of such vulnerabilities through setting public policy targets for the most vulnerable strata of population. In this respect, the conference recorded that many Islamic institutions such as Zeka, Avkaf, Sadaka, Kardalasan, Kafala, a strong family unit, care for neighborhood, etc., offer ways of protection against hardships in normal situations as well as in emergencies. These institutions need to work together with Islamic banks in promoting financial inclusion, purpose-driven entrepreneurship, especially for SMEs, education, low-cost housing, and other means for the empowerment of the underprivileged segments of the population. Six. The conference also called to attention the Islamic guidelines for the case of debtors who face difficulties in dream economic situations, calling for debt relief. The guideline given by the Holy Quran, Bismillah, if someone is in hardship, then let there be postponement or debt repayment until a time of ease. But if you give from your right as charity, then it is better for you if you only knew. Is most relevant in situations such as banks, international financial organizations, as well as advanced countries to provide debt relief to the vulnerable individuals, corporations, and states. There are some measures underway, but a lot more may be needed. 
Seven, the conference provided food for true for researchers that economics is more about how to solve social dilemmas not, and not simply about how to solve scarcity. Scarcity itself is an outcome of wrong solutions. This framework naturally includes the principles of Islamic economics and finance. The conference noted that a new world order is taking shape. It is high time for Muslim countries to form alliances to protect and improve their due status and representation in global forums and decision-making processes. The concept of an ummah needs to be promoted. Nine, the conference takes note of the emergence of platform capitalism augmented by technological breakthroughs such as artificial intelligence, big data, fintech, and the rising importance of the social media and circular economy transition. Emergence of such technologies will set the future of our societies and civilizations. All stakeholders must respond to the and the opportunities offered by these technological developments for achieving shared prosperity and sustainability in the emerging global situation. 10. The conference emphasized that one important aspect of sustainable development relates to environment and ecology. Blind following of GDPism has given rise to many problems such as global warming, unsafe disposal of industrial waste, and overuse of renewable energy to the neglect of the interests of future generations. The whole development process needs to be re-evaluated in order to adopt more human policies. 11. The conference emphasized the importance role of research and teaching institutions in shaping the future course of history and for community service. These institutions should design new courses at both graduate and undergraduate levels. And research projects, especially in circular ecological economy transition, to meet future challenges, some of which have been highlighted above emerging from the discussions in this conference. 12. The participants offered their sincere thanks to the people and government of Turkey, in general the president, the faculty of IZU, and the members of steering, academic, and executive committees of the conference, in particular for the excellent arrangements made for the conference despite difficult circumstances and providing this opportunity for dialogue and discussion. And uh, it was also organized uh, the sixth international symposium on Islamic economics and finance education in a one session. In my last words, again, I would like to thank to all the members of uh, the steering committee, academic committee and executive committee, and also to uh, the organizations uh, that uh, were together with us, supported us, and also uh, their chairs and uh, their teams. And now uh, I would like to give uh, the speaking uh, to first to Dr. Sami Suveil. Uh, for each speaker, I said 15, but 12. This is 12 conference. We I read 12 articles and 12 minutes is enough, I think, for each. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Sami Suveil, the director of URTI. If he is not ready, we can move to Professor Dr. Azmi Omar, uh, the president of INSAFE and former director of URTI. The floor is yours, Professor Azmi Omar. Please go ahead. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Professor Mohamed Bulut, Professor Arif, uh, Dr. Sami Swailam, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. As usual, let me thank Istanbul Zaimi University, Ilti, Hamad bin Khalifa University, Participation Bank Association of Turkey, Musiat, oh, sorry, uh, TKBB, the sponsors, Musiat, SESRIC, uh, paper presenters, participants, staff of uh, Istanbul Zaimi University, and all those who have supported the conference. Thank you, thank you for all of you who have made this 12th conference a success. It is indeed uh, a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, to give a few words on behalf not only of INSEF but also on behalf of the International Association of Islamic Economics, uh, an association which was established way back in 1984 the oldest association for Islamic economics and finance. The theme for this conference uh, today, uh, which we have witnessed for the last uh, one week, the theme is very relevant today because we talk about sustainable development for the real economy and we are today in the period of COVID-19, a period where we have not experienced before this is a new situation, unprecedented, but a situation where all of us are trying to adjust and make the best of this difficult situation. For example, the conference that we have today, I would say the first time in our international conference for Islamic economics and finance to have it online. Previously, we have it face to face, in person, where we have the opportunity to meet physically with friends discuss issues and so on but this is a situation where you can only discuss virtually but nevertheless the conference alhamdulillah went well it was a series of discussion and professor mehmet uh, mehmet bulu just now has also read out the communique of the conference and it encapsulate encapsulates all the ideas that were discussed during the conference let me talk a bit about what the association intends to do. The International Association for Islamic Economics is an association that focuses on research, that focuses on education for Islamic economics and finance. What we want to do is to continue to push further the agenda of research in Islamic economics and finance. So to do that, we need to bring more young researchers. Researchers, both not only male and female, but also researchers from different parts of the world. We notice some of the participation comes from West African countries, from African other parts of African countries, from Middle East, from South Asia, as well as Southeast Asia. If you look at where Islamic banking is located now, it's from African continent right to American continent. So we need to bring more researchers, more young researchers, to do not only theoretical research in Islamic economics and finance, but also to do applied research as well as policy research. We want to bring them, the younger people, into this agenda so that we can continue bringing the agenda of Islamic economics to the world. We have the opportunity now, as you can see, the situation that we are in, we must show that Islamic economics has a solution to this world's problem. I would say that our Islamic economics is based on Sharia principle, it is based on justice, it is based on ethicals. So we want to show that we are concerned not only about families, about individuals, about society. We are also concerned about environment, which we have discussed earlier on in the conference. We are talking about having a circular economy with zero waste. We are also concerned about having proper governance. We discussed about the, the usage of blockchain, whereby we can have transparency, we can have trust, and what we want to do in this area is that we want to incorporate Islamic social finance using blockchain so that we can have more trust, we can have proper governance, and as a result, we have transparency. Hence, we can really showcase Islamic social finance is one of the tools to, to expand further the contribution of Islamic economics and finance to the world. 
So as I mentioned earlier on, the importance of, bring, uh, of bringing more people into the Islamic economics and finance agenda. Having more young people from different parts of the world, having both male and female, will enrich our research. So we hope one day when we meet again next year in the 13th conference, we will have participants coming from not only from West Africa, but also from North Africa, from South Africa, from the Middle East, from the Central Asia, from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and possibly, of course, from America, where I see Professor Kabir Hassan is, is watching now, as well as student, uh, participants coming from South America, particularly Suriname, as well as Guyana, which now have Islamic banking. So again, I thank you, uh, Professor B uh, Mahmoud Bulut. I thank you, Istanbul Zaim University. I thank you, all the keynote speakers. I thank you, all the speakers in the conferences, the, 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 the team that are working very hard to ensure the, the conference is a success, and to everyone. Wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Maalaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Professor Azmi Omar, for this uh, good speech and good uh, contributions. And now uh, we can move to Professor Dr. Arif Arsoy, uh, the director for International Research Center uh, of Islamic Economics and Finance at Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University. And uh, the uh, contributor to our organization. Professor uh, Arsoy, the uh, floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to congratulate the organizers of this important event, the participants who are contributed very important point to the conference, the listener, our rulers, I would like to thank them. This important organization uh, took place in a very important time uh, during that COVID-19 disaster a, a pandemic and also Today, the whole world, we are facing many problems, economic problems, social problems, uh, other many area of uh, our life needs to uh, uh, re-evaluate and find out new solutions for solving and counter problem. As you know, this conference is important because it is bringing promising uh, to some main principles in order to solve to find our solutions for problem of our time as you know throughout history such disasters shape the prevailing system and also put forward and some new changes for for example, after settlement in Mesopotamia, the people of that time uh, dealt with agricultural economic activities. They had a lot of problem. After the, the flood of the uh, Mesopotamia, Prophet Nuh uh, came, Nuh came and changed the system and broke law and order and after that time, after that change, a new system established and uh, civilized started to develop. In the uh, later history, many disasters caused many problems, but also they produced some new uh, solutions. We are taking this conference at the turning of history at the beginning of 20th century. As you know, we have a lot of economic problems at inter uh, international as well as national and regional um, level. 
and scholar of our time came together and discussed during seven days many issues are facing uh, humanity. Owing to this season, we should uh, evaluate what we should do in the future. You know, when in all human history, where there are four stages of solving problems. First, we should believe how we can solve this problem. Later, uh, after uh, believing, we should discuss scientifically our belief, our uh, proposals, our paradigms uh, using a scientific method, ilmi method we call it, and then uh, come together and discuss uh, our theories, our uh, explanation, our solutions. This third stage is stage of discussion. First stage is stage of Iman. Second stage is state of thought. Uh, for fifth, uh, fourth stage is stage of implementing. If all these four stages complemented each other, then we can realize solutions for encounter problem. Now, when we take Iman concerning our belief or world view of this conference, the main world view of this conference is based on Tawhid and Adale. We call this world view uh, human rights centered world view of cooperation and solidarity. Here in this world view, we have no any problem because throughout human history, when some ma major problems came out, prophets came or the, the, some follower followed the path of the prophets because all prophets of God, they uh, call people, humanity to come together to establish cooperation and solidarity and solve their problems. Uh, today, uh, the prevailing system of today uh, have lost their ability of solving problems. As you know, at the end of last century, socialism, which was based on political monopoly, couldn't produce new solutions for economic and social problems. Owing to this reason, system collapsed down. And also, before capitalism, you know, uh, the other system before it, for example, during Middle Ages, uh, the uh, system, landlord system, collapsed down. Now capitalism, at the end of the 20th century, started to pro produce problems. Owing to this reason, two uh, world war took place in last century in order to shape the world. But uh, uh, the world which is shaped by powerful side couldn't produce problems. At the, uh, so, uh, couldn't produce solutions for provide, uh, uh, prevail problems. And uh, now the monopolistic capitalism is uh, losing his ability of solving problems. And owing to this reason, at this point, historical point, Islam, Islamic economy is uh, promising some solutions. Owing to this reason, we discuss during this co uh, conference uh, uh, how we can solve this problem. Now we have, uh, we should take in the future how we can implement these theories. Implementation of these theories, the first stage, we should restructure present system, uh, establish new institutions. This will be done by rulers. Uh, according to Islamic worldview, scholars are responsible to find out solutions for the prevailing problems. That is a duty of scholar, because scholar al ulama warasatul anbiya. As we know that from now on, 
prophet wouldn't come out, come again, in order to find out new solutions for prevailing problem. Who will do that? Uh, ulema will do that. Scholar will do that. As we spent a lot of effort during the uh, last seven days here where we discussed and put forward our proposals. And people uh, will be taking to the uh, uh, politician, to the businessman, to the uh, uh, com uh, social communities. They will try to reshape uh, the uh, institutional structure because without changing institutional structure, we couldn't, I mean, implement our theory or uh, the result of our discussion. And this should be, will be done uh, by a politician. And the new system will be sharing economy, participating democracy. And this system will be based on parallel interests between everybody, between countries, between nations. From this point of view, Islamic economics is a sharing economy and uh, taking uh, interest of everybody, all the people, uh, whether they are Muslim or not. As you know, every system has its own belief. For example, capitali capitalism belief worldview is Protestantism. I discussed this point with socialist country. They said, we have no any belief. We don't believe anything. I say, you have a belief, you have a religion. What is your religion? Your religion is Marxism. Owing to this ism, Islam is shaping as a belief system, Muslim worldview or worldview of sharing economics. From this perspective, we accept and do believe prophets of God, Noah, Moses, Abraham, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon him, they, they, all of them are prophets of Allah. They should, uh, try to establish peace and cooperation between people. Owing to this season, the coming century will be based on a new system, which is worldview is uh, human-centered, uh, mutual cooperation and uh, taking parallel interest approach. I do believe that the uh, 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 papers, ideas which are put forward during this conference will be considered and will be discussed in the future. And we use new technologies during this conference time, and only uh, the participant or the people who are listening us, they are not listening. The future people will evaluate that, and we will discuss this point. I hope in the near future, we will establish a new world order based on Tawhid and Adala. Owing to this reason, again, I want to thank all organizers, all people who have participated, and all people who listened to this co uh, conference. I hope this conference results will be tried to be implemented in coming years, inshallah. And I hope some countries will take this opportunity and establish a sharing economic system in order to be example for solving economic problems of our time. Uh, from this point of view, I think the position of Turkey is very important because we implemented capitalist system, we reached some results, and now we are going to find out new solutions. No, anybody shouldn't be afraid of new solution. This will be betterment of betterment for everybody, for American, for all parts of the world. It is not like capitalism, a monopolistic system 
will serve only certain groups of monopolists. This system is rahmatan lil alameen. It will serve all humankind. Thanks Allah that gave this opportunity for us to participate, to share our knowledge with each other. Thanks to you very much. I wish success. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Yeah. Yeah. That is all uh, I tried Dr. to summarize. Uh, yeah. Professor Karim Hassan from University of New Orleans, United States. Did you hear me, Professor Hassan? Can you open your microphone, please? The other side, they have to control it. Can you hear me? It is very good. Okay, we hear you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Awazu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Actually, uh, you know, I was planning to come to Istanbul, Turkey. Then pandemic came in. I was very skeptical. How is it going to go? I was really very impressed. Actually, I have attended many of the sessions, including all the keynote speeches. And I want to thank uh, Professor Mahmoud Bulut for taking this leadership, uh, Samia Soelam Irti and um, Salman Sayyid Ali, uh, Torikullah Khan, and inside there is Abdul Qadir Chachi and Burhan Saiti and the others who has done this wonderful job of making these things wonderful. I want to thank personally to Safa Yaldirim. I mean, you know, with this Zoom technology is new to us, just least amount of interruption. Every session was done, very wonderfully done. And what, uh, in addition to that, what happened with this um, recording this thing, so it is, it will have a history in the online. People can go back and listen to the lectures and benefit from it. And uh, judging, when I was not the committee or selection of the papers, uh, the papers quality are pretty good. Um, it has covered all areas, uh, but as uh, Professor Azmi Umar mentioned, there are absence from certain parts of the world like West Africa, um, Asia, Middle East, and we really have to make this organization, IAE, is more democratic and more inclusive, and we have to really instill the culture of democracy, how the leadership, how the committee, how the membership, and all these things really Done. I have been going through this conference for the last 10 years and some way always is an odd hoc basis, the leadership. You know, we want to change the world, we want to have a shared economy, we want to bring the and we can even run an organization properly. I mean leadership and leadership
Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Probably I'm kicked out of the meeting room. Um, so far. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, I was uh, trying to say that, you know, this organization uh, is, uh, um, and we try to change the world, Makasid of Sharia, bring good things. So we should start right with this organization. Hopefully, uh, now we can, you know, bring democracy, how we choose our leadership, not on an ad hoc, or ad hoc basis. So uh, I'm pretty much done with that thing. I just want to thank you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Professor Hassan, thank you so much for your contributions. And now uh, we, I want to move to Dr. Sami Suveil, uh, the director, acting director of URTE. The floor is yours, Dr. Sami. Uh, we have a, a small connection problem with Dr. Sami. I want to uh, say something before uh, contact with him. Uh, as you know, uh, this conference first time uh, is realized in this way by online uh, in a week and all the presentations uh, are recorded uh, in YouTube and it is really uh, it is really very impressive and uh, I would say uh, we hosted very important speakers from all of the world uh, as you know we start with the president of Republic of Turkey Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and then we had two keynotes, uh, two ministers from Turkey and Pakistan, 
And then in every uh, day, we had two keynotes from uh, really important scholars from all over the world. And uh, all the speak, uh, speech are recorded. And uh, maybe this is also a new challenge for us. And in its history, in the Conference of History, this is again, uh, I think, a very good contribution. And uh, the followers and maybe the new generations can find and can listen, can follow these important scholars, these important speech uh, during the conference were realized. Uh, and uh, I would like to stress this point. And now I want to move to Dr. Salman Said Ali. I think he will uh, say something instead of uh, Dr. Sami Suhail. Dr. Salman, did you hear me? Can you open your microphone, please? We are not hearing you yet. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm speaking on behalf yes, of Dr. Samuel Suelem because there was some connection problem. And basically, we would like to thank from IRTI, Islamic Research and Training Institute and Islamic Development Bank, uh, the excellent arrangement that the IZU has made for success of this 12th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance. Uh, to all the teams that were working, which we know, and the team that we do not know, they were working behind the scene, the people who contributed to the success, to the authors of the papers who contributed, to the discussants, to the keynote speakers, and in fact, everybody else, including your good self, Dr. Guru, and uh, the other organization, uh, the International Association of Islamic Economics as well. Uh, we hope that uh, we will continue this tradition in future. And uh, I heard that there is a plan for 13th, 14th, 15th conferences. How it will be materialized, it will be later. But uh, basically, we are thinking and we, uh, we hope that the things that are discussed and uh, the intentions that are made during this conference will be acted upon and we will get researchers and academicians who will take it further to implementation. As we mentioned earlier, that there are many good ideas, but good ideas in themselves are not sufficient to be accepted. There has to be a push for any good idea. What better a good idea than Quran itself? But itself, there was a prophet who was propagating it. So the good ideas have its own market, but they require a push. And this series of conferences, the university teachings, the academic research, the policy research, that all are that kind of, that provide that kind of push and we have to coordinate our activities together. Uh, one area that uh, is coming up and all authors and different people have talked about different areas is the technology that how to merge the technology with Islamic finance and what are the uses of that, not only for finance, but for also for economics. Uh, these are the things that we should consider in our future conferences and our future research. With that, I thank again on behalf of Dr. Sami Swellam, on behalf of Islamic Research and Training Institute uh, to, uh, for this excellent organization. And I hope that uh, the things will be available, the papers in the printed form, as well as on the YouTube segregated, so that people can watch whatever they like indexed in a manner that is easy to access. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Salman, for your contributions, for your speech. Uh, my uh, distinguished uh, scholars, and professors, uh, Professor Arik, Professor Azmi Omar, 
Professor uh, Kabir Hassan and uh, Dr. Salman and uh, Dr. Sami Suveil. Uh, again, I would like to thank to all of you for your contributions, uh, for your uh, good uh, explanations and for uh, sharing your ideas. Uh, at this point, I again would like to thank to all the contributors. Uh, first, to the team of URTI, under the leadership of Dr. Sami Suveil and Dr. Selman, and uh, to the team of uh, Turkish Participation Bank Association, uh, to the all uh, CEOs of banks and under the leadership of Metin Özdemir, and all I would like to thank to uh, the Association of Islamic Economics and Finance, to Dr. Omar Hafuz and to all his team. And I would like to thank to uh, the leadership of Musiat, Abdurrahman Khan and his team, and also to the Sestrik, uh, Dr. Nabil and his team, and uh, to uh, last but not least, to all my team at Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, to Ibrahim Güray Yumuşak, the Dean of the uh, Management uh, Faculty, and to uh, Abdülkadir Şaşi, to Safa, to Burhan, to uh, Ensari. I would like, uh, not like to extend the names, but uh, Alhamdulillah, I am very proud of them. I really have a good team. And Thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to his help, and to this good team, with this good team, not just from Izu, but from all our organizers for their contributions uh, from the beginning, from one year, and especially in recent times, uh, for their encouragement, for their support, uh, for their good wishes every time. And uh, this uh, conference can be realized and alhamdulillah uh, we recorded a history in this week i think in these seven days and uh, i hope uh, the young scholars the students phd students master students and young scholars can find so many things on islamic economics and finance on youtube from uh, today in the past and if there are some, you know, journalists, politicians, policymakers, or scholars from different areas. If they say, what is Islamic economics? Is there anything, is it is a real a science or economy, they can find so many things about this science. This is a real economy. This is a natural economy. This is a sharing economy. And this economy, is the needed today for all Islamic Ummah and for all of the world, I think. And they can find so many things. I would like to conclude with, uh, again, to say uh, thanks to all of you for your contributions and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope this can be uh, a good start again for a new feature. And I hope uh, not just speaking, but to uh, realize the, in the practice, the implementation, and I hope uh, in near future, uh, just not uh, Islamic and all of the world uh, will reach to a better life, to a better world spiritually, uh, materially, and in all aspects of the life, and I hope uh, in a new conference, such uh, this kind of conference, we can meet again in a good health, in a good conditions, and to make so many contributions to humanity, to realize sadaqai jariyas, to prepare a strong generation, uh, to make dua for us behind us, and to prepare good you know, books, articles, and the other things 
Thanks again for all of you. وَأَخِرُ دَوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ فِي أَمَانِ اللَّهِ مَا السَّلَامُ Tonturo. Tonturo. A university in the city of civilizations, Istanbul, from proud past to bright future. Among the world's top 500 sustainable universities, Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University prepares its students for illustration careers with its experienced academic staff, cutting-edge classrooms, technological research infrastructure, international collaborations, and diverse educational opportunities. Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University is the proud winner of Good Governance and Green Campus Cambridge IFA 3G Award in the year 2020. Our next winner comes from the higher education sector. The Istanbul Sabatin Zayn University is the proud winner of the 3G University Campus of the Year 2020. Welcome. My name is Mehmet Bulut and I am Director of Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, an international research university with over 11,000 students, 4,000 of whom are postgraduate students. Just last year, we were listed in top 500 sustainable university campuses around the world by Green Metrics. Our scholars are proud pioneers in the field of Islamic economics and finance, halal industry, political science and international relations. We believe in social responsibility and public service to humanity. In this spirit, we provide full sponsored education to students from the regional conflict zones to all of the world. Our university grows day by day, featuring a diverse community from more than 95 countries in a large, beautiful green campus with a minimal carbon footprint with over 60 square kilometers set aside for sustainable agriculture. We believe in that the most important capital and value is well-educated young generation. From our noble past to bright future, we are trying to do our best on higher education.
Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University is an international research university with over 10,000 students and an international student body hailing from over 87 countries to pursue degrees from among Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University's expensive selection of undergraduate and graduate programs. Science, Exploration, Innovation, Art, Sports, History, Nature, the gates of the past that open into the future lay on this campus. Istanbul Sabah Tinzaim University. Islamic economics is the collection of rules, values and standards of conduct that organize economic life and establish relations of production in an Islamic society. These rules and standards are based on the Islamic order as recognized in the Quran and Sana and the corpus of jurisprudence which was developed over the last 1400 years by thousands of jurists and academicians responding to the changing circumstances and evolving life of Muslims all over the globe. The International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance is the world's largest organization that enables its quest to be conducted in an academic environment. The International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance series have started in 1976. This series are considered among the most prestigious academic events in the field of Islamic economics and finance. In the last 45 years, significant contributions to both theory and practice of contemporary Islamic economics and finance have been realized through research and intellectual dialogue. It was held in Makkah, Saudi Arabia and organized by the King Abdulaziz University. It was organized by International Islamic University and participants came together in Islamabad, Pakistan. The conference moved into a different continent and held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. The organizer was International Islamic University, Malaysia. The fourth conference was held in Loughborough, United Kingdom, and for the first time, it was being officially recognized by Western academic world. The name of the conference series has been changed, and it became International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance. Fifth conference with its new name was held in Bahrain by the organization of Bahrain University. It was held in Jakarta, Indonesia and jointly organized by Indonesian Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank of Indonesia. By the seventh conference, a new session has been included. Hereupon, an Islamic Economics and Finance Education Symposium during the conference has been held as well. The organizer of the seventh conference was King Abdulaziz University and it took place in Jada, Saudi Arabia. Eighth conference was the beginning of a new trend because more than 100 papers presented during the conference. It was jointly organized by Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies and the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries and held in Doha, Qatar. Similar to eighth conference, ninth conference was one of the most productive events in the history of the series. In total, these two conferences have produced five English volumes and two Arabic volumes of the papers presented. Ninth conference was held in Istanbul, Turkey, and organized by the Statistical, Economic and Social Research and Training Center for Islamic Countries. After two years, Doha became the host of the conference again. Tenth conference was jointly organized by Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies and Economic and Social Research and Training Center of Islamic Countries. The final stop of the series was Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and International Islamic University, Malaysia with Islamic Research and Training Institute and International Association for Islamic Economics undertook the organization. There are some cities that can welcome all in its rich culture and heritage. It can unite continents, oceans, roads and give life to business. Even at the age of 8500, they continue to inspire the world. Istanbul is one such city, the seat of three great empires, a city that embraces two continents and welcomes the sea at its heart. Istanbul is the only city to maintain its stance 
as an economic center in every period of history. Currently, Istanbul is standing out as the major economic center of the country with a GNP share of approximately 23%. Almost all the headquarters of insurance, leasing, factoring companies and private finance firms are based in Istanbul. The Istanbul Stock Exchange, established as a free zone, is rapidly rising as one of the significant markets of the world. This great historical city is redefining itself as international finance, real estate and tourism destination. In phase with previous conferences held in different parts of the world and organized by esteemed institutions, for the second time, the conference is taking place in Istanbul, Turkey under the team Sustainable Development for Real Economy. Twelfth Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance will provide a platform for dialogue and discussions between policymakers, academicians, researchers, graduate students and practitioners to address the problems of sustainable development in the fourth industrial revolution era from the perspective of Islamic economics and finance. It has been jointly organized by Istanbul Sabahattin Zaim University, Islamic Research and Training Institute, International Association for Islamic Economics, Hamad bin Khalifa University, and Participation Banks Association of Turkey. Finally, we would like to express our thanks to each order of 132 papers that will be presented during the conference. Welcome to 12th International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance.